Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. Yo, it's your boy, the odd guy himself, Malik King Scott. Hi, I'm Charlie Edwards. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Kosmo. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 110 of the Box Hard Podcast. I am your host, Joey Coastman. Iaz is again not with me because of some personal family issues, so he couldn't be here. But we've been replaced by Mr. Eddie Chambers, of course, the former heavyweight world title challenger, friend of mine personally. Eddie, thank you once again for stepping in Iaz's shoes and replacing him. Not a problem, my man. You know, I'm always available for you for the show, bro. Yeah, man, I really appreciate that. Right, let's dive straight into the reviewing. So we're going to talk about the fights, of course, from last week. There was a fight on Friday night, if I'm not mistaken. I think it was um, at the at the Federal Event Center, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in Michigan, in Flint. It was the hometown of Anthony Durrell. Um, yeah, top of the bill. Anthony Durrell, 30-1 and one with one draw, took on Dennis Duglin, 20-5. and five. Obviously, UK fans know Dennis Duglin for being stopped by George Groves once upon a time, but Dennis Duglin came on the show about two or three weeks ago now. Real, real nice guy. Um... You know, and he was he was clearly saying to me that he was so happy about this fight because he believed that he'd been given sufficient time to prepare for a fight, which is a rare thing in his case. But um, unfortunately for him, he he didn't get the win, but it was a strange one. I know that you haven't seen this fight, Eddie, but what actually happened is it went six rounds and then it ended on a technical decision because there was an accidental head clash and I think Anthony Durrell got a little bit of a cut on his eyebrow, just above his eyebrow and there was pictures going around of this cut and it just looks so small, like it just literally just looks like a little paper cut I know really? couldn't, but yeah, yeah, people were raging saying that, you know, it was just crazy how the fight got stopped because of this cut and apparently it was a real kind of like close fight after those five or six rounds there so um dennis oh, yeah? Doug- yeah dennis duglin believes that he was winning the fight by a round of course um you know he, he, he was just he just come up a tiny little bit short i think the judges maybe had it something like i think because it was a technical decision i think the sixth round was scored i think they had it something like four two uh maybe maybe even a little bit closer i think there might have been a 10 10 round in there so hard luck once again for dennis duglin anthony Durrell now 31 on one with one draw, not very impressive from him, but he gets the win. Uh, also on this build, Jamonte Clark, twelve and zero, defeated Dominic Dalton, who is nineteen oh. and one with one draw. That was a majority decision in favour of Jamonte Clark. I haven't seen too much of this Jamonte Clark, but he seems like he's a decent fighter. Eddie, do you know anything about him at all? No, I've heard some about him, but I've but I know Dominic Dalton really well, and he's really talented. And it's kind of you know wow, that's a, that's actually a good fight, especially at this stage in his career, so young fighting, uh, well, so early fighting a guy of that. But then we like we see guys like um you know like uh what's my man's name High Tech, you know what I mean? With only a few fights fight for world titles, so nowadays it just doesn't surprise me at the level these guys are fighting so early. And also on this bill, Leon Lawson the third. Um, I know that he's some kind of relation to the Durrells. Obviously, we know that uh, one of the Durrell uncles, Leon, Leon Lawson, he jumped in the ring um, after Andre Durrell's last fight and ended up throwing a punch bare-fisted at the opponent. I can't remember who it was now, but yeah, this is some kind of son, I think, of Leon Lawson. And he actually made his pro debut here, and he picked up a KO in round one against Robert Sayam, who was 2-7. and seven. So an expected win there for Leon Lawson the third. Right, moving over now to the Dominican Republic in the Hotel Haragua. Um, this is a frequent venue now for Guillermo Jones. He's still knocking about his record 40 and 3 with two draws. He took on a guy called Yatalo Perea, who was 10 and 2 with two draws. Again, I'm not quite sure why, but in Haiti and, and in some parts of... Um, the Dominican Republic, they have these strange 11 round fights and anyway, I'd imagine that it's just purely to try and shake out any kind of close decision because you know, you can give 6 rounds to 6 is a draw, I think they're trying to kind of avoid that with the 11 round things I could be wrong, however, it was a very close fight, it was a split decision in favour of Guillermo Jones, he's now 41 and 3 with 2 draws and he picked up the vacant WBA Fede Latin heavyweight title, so 
all the very best to Guillermo Jones. Moving over now to Poland. Thomas Adamek, a man that, Eddie, you know very well, of course, 51-5. and five. He's still knocking about at heavyweight. He won the vacant Republic of Poland international title against Fred Cassie, a man that Huey Fury got a win over a couple of years ago. Fred Cassie now 18-7 and seven with one draw. It was a unanimous decision over 10 rounds in favour of Thomas Adamek. Once again, for those people that may not know, go and watch the Chambers and Thomas Adamek fight where, um, you know, Eddie Chambers injured one of his arms and pretty much won the fight in many people's eyes, just throwing one arm out, you know, just fighting with one hand. So, uh, yeah, he didn't get the he didn't get the decision that night, of course, but um, that's that's one to go and to go and look at if you haven't seen it. Also on this bill, there's a heavyweight prospect, but. Oh, he might actually be a cruiserweight prospect, seeing as he came in, you know, just under the cruiserweight limit. A guy called Adam Bowski, he's 10-0. He defeated Demetrius Banks, who's 9-2. and That's an eight-round unanimous decision there from Bowski. Uh, moving over now to the SSE Arena in Belfast, Northern Ireland. This one was really the, the bill that kind of captured my attention anyway. The return of Carl Frampton. Carl Frampton, 23-1, and one, took on Horatio Garcia, 33-3 and three with one draw. Um, Frampton was, well, he touched down in, in round seven, but, you know, it looked to me like a bit of a slip. What I will say about this, a lot of people were kind of bashing Frampton online. You know, the, the way I saw it... I don't know. Frampton, you know, he'd been out the ring for quite a while. The first couple rounds, though, he looked very, very sharp. You know, he started really fast. He was very sharp. He was, um, you know, looking really good. Um, To think that he hadn't fought for 10 months is not really such a long time, but... You know, he didn't really appear rusty in the on the first part of the fight. The, you know, the early rounds and stuff like that. Um, he was landing a lot of single shots. He was being very elusive. He was boxing a lot off the back foot as well. He was kind of allowing his man to push him back almost. Even though Garcia was the biggest man or the bigger man, I think that Frampton was kind of voluntarily going backwards, inviting him in, to which Frampton was then picking great single shots and making Garcia look a little bit silly in the early rounds. Obviously, Garcia promoted promoted by Canelo. Canelo was in Northern Ireland, would you believe it, ringside. Um, You know, Garcia kind of, in the fight, adopted. He kind of adjusted a little bit. He kind of adopted a little bit of a pressure fighting kind of style. He was relentless in in his work. And he won a couple of those rounds. But going into the sixth round, he had a great, great round in the sixth, I think, if if I can remember correctly, the, the, the sixth or the seventh. And then, obviously, Frampton seemed to tire a little bit. And then Frampton got that you know, that strange kind of knockdown where he touched down, that was a 10-8 round, um, you know, the first half was quite good, the second half of the fight, Garcia really came on, um, and then in the last couple rounds, really, even though Frampton was tired, I think the last couple rounds, I think Frampton won, that's kind of why, in my opinion, he won the fight, it was it was a lot closer than, than the scorecards were, but no, you know, Frampton really had to step his game up, especially for those last two rounds, in my opinion, but in my eyes, he was the rightful winner, I think one of the judges' scorecards, it was only a 10-rounder, a lot of people saying, thank God for that, because I don't know, you know what would have happened in the in the eleventh and twelfth round if they were you know if they were there, but yeah, I think one of the scorecards was ninety eight ninety three which I thought was a little bit wide in my opinion, but nonetheless, the return of the jackal was successful he's now signed some kind of deal with frank warren he's now twenty four and one and Horatio Garcia is now thirty three and four with one draw he still hasn't been stopped um actually, I should also mention that last week I picked. Frampton to win on points, whereas um, the listeners actually picked Frampton to win by knockout, and so did Ayers, so I gained a point there. Moving down this bill once again, we're going to talk about now the Zelani Tete um, win over Siboniso Gonya, who was 11 and 1. Obviously, Zelani Tete 25 and 3. It was for the WBO World Bantamweight title. Boy, oh boy. Unbelievable stuff. The fight was over in six seconds of the first round. And if I'm not mistaken, I think Zelani Tete now breaks a world record. I think it's the quickest win in any world title fight in boxing in history. So that is unbelievable stuff there for Zelani Tete. To be honest, I think the man was overmatched. I don't think he'd been in the rankings for very long. It was one of those guys, like I say, to be in the top 15 and you're only 11 and 1. Straight away, when the fight got made, I didn't think it was 
you know, it was going to go too long. I thought he'd probably get the knockout and look quite good doing it, especially being in Ryan Burnett's backyard. Um, you know, he was celebrating quite wildly when he knocked the guy out. And, you know, they, they, they kept the camera off of Gonya when he was down because, you know, when the when the camera zoomed in on him at first, his eyes rolled back in his head. It was a real horrible, disgusting kind of knockout. You know, he got caught straight away, the first punch that Zelani Tete threw. Like I say, Zelani Tete was celebrating. They had to kind of tell him to calm it right down because things were looking quite scary. And... um you know, he was a bit of a mismatch. But yeah, he gets the win. He's a likeable character. I really wish Zolani Tete all the best. He seems like a nice guy. And hopefully we see him in some big fights next year. Moving up once again, John O'Carroll moved to 15-0. and It was a win over Humberto Di Santiago. I think it was... Uh, not not a late replacement, but a bit of a last minute kind of thing. It was for the vacant IBF Intercontinental Super Featherweight title. Um, you know, it was a good fight. I think the stoppage in this fight looked a little bit worse than what it was because the opponent's arms got tangled up in the ropes and he couldn't defend himself or throw a punch for a moment. And that was, you know, just at that moment was the time where John O'Carroll was throwing a combination. So it looked better than what I think it was, if you know what I mean. I don't think the guy was as hurt as it appeared. Um, the referee, of course, had to jump in and stop it, though, because the guy couldn't defend himself. You know, I suppose the stoppage was good, but like I say... Not going to be too overcritical, but I think it was a little bit, you know, not premature, but it, it wasn't as as bad. It was The guy wasn't in as much danger as it may have appeared initially. Um, also on this bill, what else have we got? Paddy Barnes moved to 5-0. and He also picked up the vacant WBO Intercontinental Flyweight title against Elisa Quezada, who was 21-6 and with three draws. It was a KO in round six for Paddy Barnes. I was really impressed with him. Um, a great finish there. It was a left hook from the, I think it was head to body. I think he stopped him. Um, I think he threw a left hook upstairs, a left hook downstairs, stopped him with a body shot. Really good finish, really brutal stuff there from Barnes, who gets knocked sometimes for, you know, not really having the punch power, but he seemed to do quite well there. Really exciting fight as well. Also on this bill, um, the final fight to mention, Jerwin and Cajas, the Filipino, if I'm not mistaken, he's promoted by Manny Pacquiao. Anyway, he came over, his record was 27-1 and one with one draw. He put his IBF World Super Flyweight title on the line against Jamie Conlon, undefeated 19-0, and 0, brother of Michael Conlon, who's recently signed with Bob Arum. Anyway, Conlon, we know he likes to have a fight, he likes to neglect his boxing skills. Oh boy, it was... I don't want to be too harsh on him, but, you know, what I saw of it, he was way out of his depth. Um, You know, the knockdown, I think it was maybe, was it in the first round? I think it was in the first round where he seemed to not really get, you know, not really take a punch. And then he just went down on one knee. It was really confusing. And I haven't heard anything about what it was about. So that was quite weird. That was a straight away 10-8. And then obviously, you know, he came out in the second round. He looked okay. But still, he just, he probably didn't win the round. Um, You know, he just had a completely awful night, really. And it's a shame because that awful night came on the biggest night of his career. But yeah, it was a bit of a mismatch. It was a bit hard to watch at some times. He took a proper beating. Um, I don't want to say, you know, he's weak to the body, but every time Ankahas hit him to the body, he pretty much went down. But he was down in total. He was down in in round one, round three, round four, and round six. But luckily for him at one stage, Ankahas was deducted a point in round five for repeated low blows. So he won that round 10-8. But... You know, the only reason the guy was throwing low blows is because he kept just going to the body and Jamie Conlon just couldn't do anything about it, to be honest. So unfortunately for him, a really nice guy. I really wanted him to win, but unfortunately for him, he got stopped and he loses his O. He's now 19-1 and one, and Jerwin Ankahas really, really impressed. Now he's had 30 fights. He's got 28 wins, one loss and one draw. Really exciting future for Jerwin Ankahas. Again, that was a fight where we predicted on. And our listeners were very very clever again our listeners are doing so well at the moment our listeners actually picked and Cahas to win by knockout they got that right I thought and Cahas would win on points I got that wrong and I was way off he actually picked Conlon to win on points that wasn't going to happen it was quite um, evident after about two rounds that wasn't going to happen so so once again very well done there to our listeners moving over now to the cosmopolitan of Las Vegas in Nevada USA this one is well we're coming down to the the last couple of fights now from last week 
Um, on this bill, what have we got? What have we got? One fight, really. Julian Williams, 23 and 1, with one draw, took on Ishe Smith, 29 and 8. This was a 10 round. Um, a 10 round fight I picked Julian Williams to win this fight by knockout even though Ishe Smith hadn't been knocked out in any of his losses he's never been knocked out in his long career I think he's now 39 years old he's been in the game a long long time I think it's 17 years he's been a pro now I thought that Ju- you know Julian Williams would probably get the knockout we had him on the show last week but no I was wrong our listeners once again were right they picked J-Rock to win on points and I has actually picked um, J-Rock to win on points as well so he picked up a point there so very well done to both of you guys I as you too um, yeah so in this fight I mean I, I saw a couple little bits of it really Julian Williams um, I don't know it was funny because Ishe Smith's never really in the eye-catching fights I don't feel I think some of his fights I tend to avoid um, you know I don't want to be overly critical but most of his fights, he's very defensive, but here he was actually in quite a good fight. I felt it was quite a good fight. I know that Julian Williams doesn't actually have a promoter, so when it went to the scorecards, I thought the fight was a lot closer than what the scorecards were. And I thought that if there was going to be any closeness, you know, any kind of controversy, I thought that Ishe Smith would benefit, seeing as it was a Mayweather Promotions card. But um, yeah, it wasn't that. It wasn't that way. I think Ishe Smith thought he won. And after the fight, Eddie, you're going to like this. Ishe Smith said to Julian Williams, go home and do the lottery. Because he felt that he was so lucky to get the win, Julian Williams, that Ishe Smith advised him to do the lottery. But no, I think, you know, he probably won the fight. You didn't catch any of this one, though, Eddie, at all? I think it was on bounce, if I'm not mistaken. I, I like Julian, you know, he's from um, my home gym from, you know, for years, Schuler's, and um, I thought he did, I thought he looked good, he was sharp, a lot of the shots he was firing were really sharp, you know, like good counter punches as well, um, when he used his jab, it was effective, but one thing uh, about Shea Smith, and, <laughs> and I heard your picks, and I was like, man, I don't know if he was going to go down, I don't think I've ever seen him really hurt that bad before, you know what I mean, ever, so he's a tough, tough guy to Shea Smith, and he's definitely cagey, and I liked what he was doing, every single time Time Julian seemed to make a rally, he would come back, you know what I mean, with two or three, four or five shot combinations. So it was really difficult, I know, for, for it should have been, for judges to see how at times the fight was going Julian's way because he was just so active and so responsive to his offense, you know what I mean, to Julian's offense. But I do think that Julian, land, Julian landed the, you know, showier your shots, the sharper shots, you know, the ones that maybe even had more of, a, more of an effect throughout the fight. And I think that's really ended up with what the difference was. But I thought it was more much closer, much closer than, uh, you know, the score actually turned in. And it could have, I mean, listen, at times it looked like it was going to go either way. But I still think Julian landed uh, the better shot. Yeah, I mean, I tend to agree. I mean, the reason I went with... um you know, with with Julian to get the knockout, I just believe that Ishe Smith. I think he was coming off quite a long layoff. I can't remember now exactly, but I just thought that could have played a part. I know that Ishe Smith's had some serious problems outside the ring. You know, those things, of course, take a mental toll on you. Um, yeah, but no, I was wrong, and Julian Williams got the win at the end of the day, but it wasn't by a knockout. Moving over now to a card that happened this Tuesday, just a couple of days ago. We couldn't talk about the result last week, of course, because the fight hadn't happened. It happened just a couple of days ago. It was at the Coliseum in St. Petersburg, Florida, USA. One fight to mention on this bill, really. Well, a couple fights to mention. Firstly, two of Gary Russell Jr.'s brothers were on the bill. One called Gary Antoine Russell. He moved to 10 and... Oh, sorry, not 10 and 0. 3 and 0 with a TKO in round one against a guy who was 4 and 7 with two draws. And his other brother moved to 10 and 0. A TKO in round one for him as well against a guy who was 11 and 5 with one draw. So both the Russell brothers there picking up first round at TKO is very well done to them. And the final fight to mention, oh no, no, we've got two fights to mention. Devon Alexander, he moved to 27-4. and four. He's been out the ring a long, long time, Devon Alexander. He took on a guy called Walter Castillo, who is 26-4 and four with one draw. Both guys were 26-4 and four going in. Castillo was down in the second round. I haven't seen much of the fight, but from what I've heard, apparently Devon Alexander looked like he hadn't been out the ring for such a long time. He looked really sharp, and he looked like he hadn't had any kind of layoff. So I'm happy about that. I think... You know, he kind of let his career slide a little bit, Eddie, in my opinion, Devin Alexander. You know, I think he was a good fighter at one stage, and then he he took a yeah. few losses to guys that he perhaps shouldn't have really lost to, and then he yeah. just kind of got lost in the wilderness, if you like. But I'd like to see him back at his best if he has still got it. 
Yeah, I think he's, he's, he's really talented. I mean, I remember when he knocked out Juan Urango, and that was at that time. You know, I didn't expect nobody to knock that guy out, but Devin was, he's really sharp, you know, nice, uh, you know, speed and, and this elusiveness, this counterpunching ability. I mean, he's just good all around. Um, has surprising power and shocking power at times. It's just, you know, maybe you know, sometimes it gets in your head. You know what I mean? Like he fought Timothy Bradley, had a tough th tough night there and had a few other tough fights following that. And it just, and sometimes you get stuck in quicksand. The harder you try sometimes, the worse it gets. Sometimes it's good to step away and, and get back after a nice layoff and, you know, relax and recover. And uh, sometimes you finish off better. Absolutely, absolutely. And now moving over to the final fight of the reviewing. It was at the Sands Bethlehem Arena. Um, I think it's called the Sands Bethlehem Event Center. It's in Pennsylvania. Is that anywhere near you, Eddie? That 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 place? Yeah, yeah. It's actually, uh, it's like it's a little ways away. It's maybe like about forty-five minutes to an hour away. But yeah, it's close by. It's not that. Far. It's cool. Is it right? Is that is it is that right? The Sands? Be is it the Bethlehem Event Center? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to make sure I'm pronouncing that right. There was a guy fighting yeah. there. He's 14 and 0. He's the brother of Atlantis Fox. His name's Michael Fox. He's 14 and 0. He moved to 15 and 0. Uh, it was a unanimous decision over 10 rounds, and he also picked up the vacant UBF All America welterweight title. This guy, Michael Fox, um, you know, he came in at 143, even though he's um, he's actually six foot three and a half, and he came in at one forty three. So that is quite unbelievable. I think he's Paul only <laughs> say that again, Paul Williams. Yeah, Paul no, Williams. Um, yeah, no. I think he was he was at he was at one forty, but he seems like he's just moved up to welterweight here. But even still, he's coming in four pounds under the under the weight limit. That's that's really quite bizarre. But anyways, that's it for the reviewing. That is it. So just before we wrap up part one, there's one last thing to do, and that is to welcome our first guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the former English and British light heavyweight title challenger, Mr. Miles Shinquin. Miles, welcome back on the show. I must apologise, we haven't spoke to you on here for over a year and a half now. My bad. <laughs> You're getting beat, then we'll be back to you. <laughs> hey, it's not that, it's not that, my friend. So, of course, <laughs> Miles, we, we last spoke, it was just before your fight against Josea Burton. Obviously, it wasn't to be your night that night. Um, since then, you've had three fights, winning two, losing one against Joel McIntyre, a guy that you'd previously beaten, and that is a fight that I haven't seen. I just wanted to really say, is there anything that you want to add to any of those four fights I've mentioned there, Miles? Um, no, you're right, the Burton, the Burton fight, it wasn't my night, but I didn't turn up, you know, it's it's a bit. It's a, it's a bit in the past now. That you know, everyone's got an excuse after a fight. I had no excuse other than on the night I lost my head uh, and didn't listen to what I was being told and took the wrong approach and paid the paid the penalty for it. Um, even though I felt like I caused him a lot of problems in the fight, still performing badly. Um, the max I lost, um, I had started to. I started to fall out of love with boxing a little bit. This is not an excuse. But he won. The, you know, we thought we we thought we won the fight by a round or two, perhaps. It was in his hometown, um, it was in a in a nightclub that was on top of the ring. Basically, the the, the crowd were probably two yards from the judges. Uh, it was very loud, very boisterous in there. So the chance of me getting a close decision there was was very unlikely. Um, in hindsight, I thought about their game down there, but I'd, I'd never put out a fight, and that's where it goes. The other two wins were, I think, just just ticking over. We just ticking over, getting a win, and getting back on the horses, as they say. And of course, your next fight now will be on December the 13th, which is a Wednesday at York Hall on the undercard of Katie Taylor's world title fight. In the other corner will be Jake Ball, obviously another light heavyweight uh, prospect. What do you know about him, Miles? Uh, not a great deal, if I'm honest. Um, I spoke to, you know, I'm with a new coach, you know, Don Charles, we've been over eight fights together through our second one. Um, I feel like if I watch other fighters against someone else, I don't learn too much because they're not fighting me um, and, and the, the person they're fighting isn't going to do the things I'm going to do. Um, so it's hard to work out what, how they react to what I do. So, you know, it's a 10 round. Uh, at title level, at championship level, uh, you've got you've got ten rounds, twelve rounds to fix someone out. Um, so I'll, I'll take it from there. You know, he's obviously he's had his wins, he's had a, he's had a, he's had a, a, a defeat, um, a quite a quick, brutal one. Um, but again, with regards to that, 
first round knockouts. I never read too much into them because anyone can get caught early. I suppose, I suppose, how you come back from that. Um, again, a good fight last time I watched. I watched it on the night. Actually, um, his last fight against Joe Sheriff was a good fight. Very, very close. That's it, really. Um, I've, I've looked a little bit, taking what I can out of it, and go from there. Don will be the main person to go, go through, go through the uh, footage of him and, and work out where to go from there. Yes, yeah, so, uh, you know, I was at that fight where he where he got stopped in the first round. I was also at his last fight. Um, yeah, talking of you linking up with Don, how's that? How's that going for you, Miles? Don's a good guy. I like Don. He's a lovely guy, really nice guy. But you know, it's it's good that there's work time and play time. That makes sense. You know, we we would get a gym, so jokey because we've got a few of the boys in there. Spent Oliver's down there. His brother Danny's down there. Um, I think Don's there. We have uh, Ian. Um, Ian Juby down there Tony Peel's down there we all have a laugh and a joke but when you start training you know it's graft time um, as soon as training's finished and the graft is over it's back to, it's back to laughing and joking again which is great um, the gym is I think seven miles from my house it takes me 15 minutes to get, get to get there where I was training in Essex before taking me an hour maybe more sometimes to get there uh, we're a young family um, it's not ideal and also with re- with rest time as well. Well, you know, I can get home, I can get food in me within 20 minutes. Um, I can get rested for my next session of the day a lot quicker, uh, and, and give that session a lot more. So I think that's that's another a, a huge bonus for me is being so close, I'm such a good trainer. Um, but I can get get the rest resting for the next session. Yeah, absolutely. And as we said there, um, you know, Jake's only loss came at, um, you know, in the first round against JJ McDonough, a bit of a mad fight. Some would say, though, that McDonough probably isn't as good as Jose Burton or Joel McIntyre. Do you believe that? <laughs> well, I think it's quite clear he's not as good as him. Um, Jose Burton, you know, although I think I've got to be in Jose Burton all day long. Um I think given the right matchmaking, he could probably go a long way. Uh, he's got all the attributes to go a long way. Um, John McIntyre, mm, not too sure on his ability level. Obviously, he's a very strong guy. And he beat what he had to do at night. That, that was me, the version of me he beat, shall I say. Um, but they were, they were both comfortably beat Madonna. But again, I don't, very, I don't get involved in looking at loops like that. Because, you know, you go back in the day, about four, for instance, they all beat each other. So who was the best? You could say anyone. You could say one of the four: Hagler, Hearns, Duran, Leonard. You know they all beat each other. But um, yeah, I don't get involved in stuff like that. He, he, and like I said to you earlier, it was one round knockout. You know, he got caught. I think he got, he got put in the ropes near the first time, and then got and then got taken out clean with the next shot. Um, yeah, I, I, I've, I've watched that probably twice because it's not really worth watching. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, just, you know, I'm thinking there, like, obviously, the two guys you've lost to, um, like like I say, some some would say were on a higher level themselves to the guy that uh, that Jake lost to, but, yeah, that, that fight was... Yeah, I've, I've, lost, I've, lost, I've, lost, a, I've lost a championship level, a, a, a decent a decent championship level. I've lost two fights, which, which one of the person I've beat before, uh, and the other person, I think it was clear I had the beating of that night. You know, my hand speed, I was causing all kind of, you know, his, his face was a mess. And if you look at us both after the fight, you'd, you'd, you'd struggle to say how, how I lost. His face was a mess after the fight. I had to, you know, I wasn't puffing, I was just, just getting into a bit of a rhythm as it happens. And, uh, and uh, I started rushing things and made made mistakes. And in, in, a, in a British tough fight, you can't make mistakes like that. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, obviously, you know, we all know that, that that Jake Ball is pretty. He's pretty heavy-handed. He's he's rangy. He's, he's six foot four. He's a southpaw. Do you feel like you're the underdog going into this one, Miles? Um, I, I don't feel that way. I, I mean, it will be perceived that way by the public. I thought, um, you know, he's been seen a lot more. When I have been seen, I've lost. And like I said, the, the version of me that was seen was was the poor version. I said it time and again, and I, and I, I felt like a robot saying the same thing, but. I know what I can do. I know I've done what I've done in the gym. I don't I was world class people sparring, training, you know, world class coaches saying saying thing and bit you know, things to me that give me confidence. But it's about transferring that to finite. Before whether it was experience and maturity, I don't know what I just feel now that I'm ready to show what I can do on finite. 
I, I, I 100% believe I will. And do you think that this fight can steal the show come December 13th? Because I, for one, am certainly very excited for this one, man. I really am. Well, I, from what I've heard, it's going to be 14 fights on the card, so it has to be a hell of a fight to uh, steal the show. But, um, yeah, you know, I think that maybe before I've always got into the into a, into a bit of a rut of trying to excite too much because, you know, I, I think my fights generally are entertaining to watch. I throw a lot of punches. I have been getting hit a lot of times in, in recent fights, which which is great to watch other people, not so much my family and friends. But perhaps you still to the show, or you know, it depends on what Jake brings in the night. If I'm honest, yeah, it um, takes two to tango, of course. It takes. Of course, he does. He he. I might clip him early, hurt him, and he goes to a shell for the night and makes a bad fight. You don't know. Um, we we'll see. I'm going to. All, all that matters now is 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 winning. Um, I, I said before, I said to a few people later, I tried to make before I tried to have the perfect victory, you know, the, the perfect punch, the perfect scenario, but that doesn't happen in boxing. Very rarely does that happen. If it does happen, it happens by chance, not by chance, but by you know, by a mistake by an opponent. And this time I'm going to, it's just it's just win at all costs. So if I've got to fight like fight for ten rounds, stand a trophy. That's what I do if I've got a box on my back foot for 10 rounds. That's what I do. If it means I'm losing after eight rounds and I've got to go out there and get, and get him out in the last round, that's what I'll do. Um, I know that I've got a, a, a load of desire to win um, and um, I'm going to prove it on December 13th. And I remember speaking to you just briefly over Twitter about another fight that that happened a few weeks ago now. John Ryder, I remember we were saying he was in for, well, we thought he was going to be in for a tough night against Patrick Nielsen on the Groves and Cox undercard. Jesus Christ, what a win. Yeah, I was there, actually. Um, I went to watch that. Um, Yeah, you know, credit to John. He's a a very, very tough man. Hung around and now he's got his his, uh, reward. He's had a couple of as soon as I've got a couple of blips on the way and lost a, lost a British title Billy Joe's in it I think um, lost here and there and got a chance and taken it and this is sort of the same situation now he was put in there I, I think as a as sort of an opponent wasn't he against Nielsen yeah definitely um, the same way I think that, the same way I think I've been viewed as an opponent by Matchroom um, but they're going to you know mistakes are made by people and this is one by them yeah, I, uh, I I was there for that one as well. I think we were speaking before, and I f- I'm sure I said to you, give me a text when you get there, but you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, but anyways, anyways. <laughs> uh, no, nah, you're all right, you're forgiven. But no, uh, yeah, of, of course, George Groves versus Eubank Jr. Now there's been a date now down February 17th, Manchester. Firstly, will you be going to watch it? Secondly, who wins it? Um, yes, I'll be going. I'm good friends with George, um, so I will be going to watch I was a while, but it was in London. <laughs> of course. But there you go. Um, and it was also, I suppose, going will depend on my next fight date after this. Um, uh, with, yeah, um, I hope to go. Uh, the winner, I, I feel, will be George because he's just a bigger, better version of Eubank. I think Eubank's only middleweight, really. Um, it's East Box 1. Top level fighter, I feel who's who's you know when I say when I say top level, I mean in their prime was Billy Joe, and for six rounds he was chase shadows. So I think George can stop him, stop him maybe around eight nine rounds. And also, I want to ask you about a light heavyweight coming through at the moment. I'm not quite sure he's going to be staying at light heavyweight. There's a few rumours, but anyways, the uh, the Olympic bronze medalist Josh Buatzi. Have you seen any of him? What's your thoughts on him, Miles? I sparred with Josh about, I don't know how long ago now, probably three years ago, maybe even more. And the time I thought, blimey, he's good. <laughs> and then he goes and wins the bronze medal. So, yeah, very good, very good. Um, what, is he going to go down the way or up in weight? I'm not I think I he might be going down. I'm not sure, though. Yeah. I think whatever weight he, whatever weight he goes at, I think he'd be a force. Yeah. Looks very good. Yeah, all the best to him, all the best to him. And finally, the final yeah. question I'm going to ask you, Miles. Um, if you've got one, you can give it to us. If not, then it's fine. Have you got any kind of prediction? How do you see your hand being raised come December 13th? Um, yeah, I'm never going to get into that again. It's, it's sort of uh, it's a bit of match, I think, all that fight predictions, like how you're going to win. I just want to win and move on. It's, it's, 
I'm 29. I don't want to be fighting forever if it's not good for your health. <laughs> so I would like to win in any way possible. If I win one round, great. If I win in a 10 round points decision, great as well. Um, but anyway, anyway necessary, and then move on. Absolutely, that is all that is important. Getting that W, of course. Okay, listen, Miles, it's always a pleasure speaking with you, mate. You know that. Best of luck for December thirteenth, and we'll catch up sometime afterwards. I'm oh, sure. Man. Thanks very much. Cheers, mate. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the preview part. But before we get into that, we go over to... Well, Ayaz is not here, so I suppose we just go over to myself with the latest news. Um, there's not really been too much to talk about, I don't think, this 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 this, this week. Um, I've asked Ayaz to send me the news. He hasn't got back to me, so what I can really talk about off the top of my head, obviously, we know that David Hay and Tony Bellew, the rematch, it was on for Sunday, the 17th of... Is it the 17th? Yeah, the 17th of December. It's now not happening. There were some rumours of, you know, a few days ago now that it wasn't going to be happening and those rumours were proven to be fake. And now those rumours, well, they're new rumours, I suppose. They are now real. It's been confirmed that the fight will be off. The reason being, I think David Hay injured one of his biceps, um, you know, in the gym. I think he, he fell he, he fell down some off some machine and he put his arm out to stop his fall kind of thing and he injured himself. So, um, yeah, he's, he's already had some kind of surgery on it and he's already showing pictures of himself in the gym and videos like hitting the speed bag with one hand and stuff like that while his other arm's in a cast. So he's, you know, they're talking about a March date or perhaps a May date. Um, what I think about this... Eddie, it's, it's a funny situation here. I was I was having this debate with a few people on Twitter. Obviously, Tony Bellew gave up his WBC cruiserweight world title. He moved up to heavyweight to fight David Hay for you know for the big money, mm-hmm. and thankfully he won and he got paid very well. But mm-hmm. now, where he's been waiting, that fight took place in early March of this year, and now the fight won't be happening the rematch won't be happening until at least March of next year. So in a whole year, you know, he, he hasn't really, he wouldn't have really earned any money. I mean, of course, he got paid very well for the David Hay fight the first time round, better than he would have got paid probably for any fight at cruiserweight. But the question kind of does, you know, you, you do kind of have the question, if he stayed there with his WBC title and defended it a few times, would he have perhaps generated more money? And not only that, but 100%, his name would have been, you know, on the list of people to be added into the Cruiserweight World Boxing Super Series tournament, which we all know everybody in that gets paid very well. So right, right. you do have to kind of question, did he make the right move? I know he wouldn't have, you know, he wouldn't have known that David Hay would have been injured. Right. And also, I think in some ways, he also wouldn't have known that he would have even won that first fight. I think he's admitted it to himself that he kind of, he believed in himself, but there was a few things that happened outside the ring, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, one of them, of course, he sent to, he sent his family away to, to a different part of the world on holiday so that they couldn't watch him in that ring. And also, there were rumours that he'd even written a will just in case for some reason David Hay, you know, beat him into some kind of condition where he, he wasn't, you know, he, he wouldn't be able to sort of live his life the way he was living it and he wouldn't have, you know, been able to you know, perhaps never speak again or something like that, some kind of bad injury. The way David Hay was talking, it kind of really got inside his head. Yeah. Do you think he made the right choice, Eddie, staying, like money-wise, staying, staying at, he- you know, going up to cruiserweight, uh, sorry, going up to heavyweight and giving up the belt, or should he have stayed at cruiser? What do you think? Well, he was looking, obviously, at the opportunity of what was ahead of him, you know, with David Hay and him being a big money guy and a big money, uh, you know, opportunity. And it's like when you when you think about it, you got to look at it, take it for what it is. You know, if the money's there, the fight opportunity is there at that moment, sometimes you just got to seize it. You know what I mean? You don't want to look at that situation and think, oh, what if this happens or what if that happens? And you want to take the opportunity that's there right then and it's liquid, it's in front of you. And sometimes, you know, it, it, you know, people will say, man, you might not have made the best decision in that. You should have maybe waited it out some. And yeah, sometimes that's right. But you're looking at David Hay and then the other options at heavyweight if you win the fight. And the fact that he won the fight now, you know, there's a rematch possibility is even probably more money. And then if he wins the rematch, now he's a big star, you know what I mean? Even more so than now. And there's opportunities to fight heavyweight champions down the line. You know what I'm saying? And 
it's not and that we already know even though the super six thing at cruiserweight is big and the money's you know they're being paid well and yeah he would probably have better chances of beating those cruiserweights than maybe some of these heavyweights you still got to look at the opportunity of maybe fighting for a world title and making you know double digit you know we, we talk about uh you know seven we well, talk about beyond seven figures now maybe you know maybe even eight figures so you got to think those possibilities are actually right in front of him possibly you know with this fight not happening who knows maybe david hay has an injury that maybe won't let him back in maybe he goes in and gets an opportunity to fight one of these other world champions for a title maybe maybe um joe parker or you know what i mean even if maybe uh wilder wants to take him you know what i mean it, 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 these things are options for him now in, in anthony joshua these are all options and if that happens you know what i mean he's gonna he stands to make more money in my opinion if he happens to win one of those fights which would be even better for him obviously then it's just the sky's the limit you know what i mean but that's all right in front of him the super six thing he wasn't really sure about at the time and i think i so i think you got to take the options that are in front of you when they're there you know what i mean i don't get me wrong i'm one i'm one of the people that would say you know wait it out maybe i should have taken the slow road the slower road and and you know like i always say maybe i should have went down the cruiser first and then went up to heavyweight i think that's a little bit of a better idea but for Be- for tony he's he's gone from light heavy to cruiser and now to heavy i think the way he's done it so far has been good and obviously he's looking better for him right now yeah, absolutely. And coming down to the final piece of news now, you haven't got any news at all, Eddie, have you? No, no, I just uh, kind of wanted to, uh, not right now. I'll wait, for, I'll, I'll wait for you to finish the news out. But I just kind of wanted to, to vent a little bit of my frustration with some people. But at this particular time, you know, I'm going to let you go ahead and finish your thing and then we'll talk after. No, no, no. This is the perfect time, Eddie. Take it away. Well, it's, it's you know, you know, I don't talk crap. I don't want to say too much, you know, you know, put too much bad language out on my man's podcast, so I'm gonna keep it trying to keep it clean. I don't talk a lot of crap. I don't I don't do thing uh to to draw a lot of attention. I'm not one of those type of people, you know what I mean? I feel like, you know, the way I was living my life, you know, before this whole Emily Joshua situation, I was extremely happy with. It. And my idea of going down the cruiser and you know, starting something there, even if not successful, would be something that would be interesting for me to do, fun for me to do, exciting for me to do. You know what I mean? So my idea to do those things were just out of, you know, passion and, and, and excitement and all of that going to that, into, into boxing. But then this thing pops up now. Maybe it wasn't happening. You know, I, I hope it wasn't. And actually, you know, it's a bad thing for him to show that kind of thing from one of our world champions. And, you know, boxing is a sport that I've been involved with for a lot, for a lot of years. And I feel like... Whoever's the world champion should be a real, a, a better, a really good, a great ambassador of of, of the sport, and and should it should show that these people can be, you know, could be sought after, could be on Wheaties boxes, and could speak well enough, and and and, and get in front of cameras and make other people say, hey, I want to be a boxer when I get older. You know, some of these kids. So I want more for them, and I would not want him to be in this position. But the amount of hate that I receive, you know, and, and you know, I laugh at it because it doesn't make me angry. You know what I mean? It just it just makes me feel like, man, these people are so misguided. You know what I mean? And they're so they may be such a supporter of this guy, which is great. And I'm happy for him. You know, and I'm happy for the fans that they they have somebody to admire. That's great. But don't be so misguided uh, in your in your in your in your thoughts and your quotes and things to try to belittle me and what my ideas was in, a, in this opportunity that I thought maybe it was an opportunity for a fight. And it was only because I got this message. Maybe they were looking for a voluntary or something like that, that I even responded with that. I, myself, if not for, you know, talking to my team and, and trying to figure out what this might mean, would have never even posted it. You know what I mean? I'm a very, very private person. I've never, I've never been arrested. I barely have any moving violations <laughs> or even parking tickets. You know what I mean? I'm a, I follow the rules. There's certain things I don't do a lot of for you know contrary to most people's belief i'm not an uncle tom you want to call it you want to say that you know what i mean i have friends of all different races which doesn't you know doesn't really matter in, in this case but you know a lot of people want to say those types of things about me because oh calling me snitches and all other kind of words that i don't even want to say on my man's podcast here but i think it's a little ridiculous you know that i'm, I'm that people are looking at me and saying those types of things because let me ask you a question right you remember those uh, those i don't know you're kind of, you're kind of young joey but uh you you remember those uh things where people were say about Mike Tyson, right? Oh, man. I fight Mike Tyson in a heartbeat, man. Get with the first punch, man. Take my million dollars home and go ahead with it. And I'm saying, I'm sitting there saying, like, damn, there's a lot of people that said that. I remember having conversations with people. I mean, this is in America. Maybe they think, think a little different in England, but uh, but over here in America, those were the type of conversations that people had. I fight Mike Tyson, get knocked out, or even shit. I fight Mike Tyson outside the ring and sue him and try to get that kind of money. And I'm sitting there thinking, like, damn, all I'm doing is looking for an opportunity to not only get myself money. I'm not even thinking just about the money, because like I said, I was happy before, you know, 
know, before this opportunity, possibly if it was an opportunity, when it came about, I was happy before that. But if you were in my position and this type of thing happened, there was an opportunity for you to be a world champion out of nowhere, to fight for a world title and maybe make a couple of million dollars out of nowhere. What the hell would you do? Would you just sit there and say, no, nah, nah, I'm not going to say nothing. I'm just going to go ahead and sit on this and not make a million dollars. So you're telling me somebody gave you a lottery ticket and said, look, all you got to do is post this thing on Instagram and talk about a few people or whatever, and, and you'll, you'll be able to cash this check for a million dollars. You mean to tell me you're not going to take it? You're just going to say no? Are you too oh, self-righteous? Oh, I can't do that. I can't do that. Really? That's what they, that's, that's what you would say? I think that's, uh, and I'm, I'm going to excuse my language, I think that's bullshit. I feel like these people who are saying these types of things, even people who are actually live near me and close to me and should be backing me, and I'm not tripping over it. I understand. You know what I mean? But this situation is completely different than what you think it is. You know what I mean? I'm not that dude. I don't give a damn about being in the spotlight. I am so happy with just being a regular person and enjoying my life from where I'm at. This was just an opportunity for me to get to the top of my sport again. It's an opportunity. You know what I mean? Any opportunity that somebody that somebody would give you or whatever you may do in your field to make that kind of money, you're going to tell me you're going to turn that, that opportunity down no matter how it comes. You know what I mean? Oh, man, you that broke. Oh man, you uh, you 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 a bitch. You, you how you gonna snitch? Ain't, ain't no snitch. Who am I snitching to? The cops ain't gonna go and wrestle for putting that up there. Ain't nobody gonna say nothing to him for putting that up. Only thing they gonna say is, well, what you got to say now, Anthony? You wanna fight him or what? Or, or was that a mistake? That's the only thing you are gonna say. Who he got to answer to? He ain't answering to none of y'all. Y'all may be his fans and all that, but there is nobody he has to answer to but himself and maybe his promoter for making a mistake. If that was a mistake, you know what I'm saying? So my my the way I'm looking at a lot of these people and, and there's people who are big time radio people and, 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 and uh, TV personalities and boxing folks, and they have the nerve to sit there and say something like that and don't know me at all and don't know the situation at all. I'm not looking to come up on this guy at all. You know what I mean? I, like I said, this came on my DM. I didn't send a message to Anthony Joshua and then try to get him to say something and then put it out there in the media. I didn't do none of that. I was sitting there and minding my business. It was the middle of the night. What the hell was I doing? What was I doing in the middle of the night sending him a message? I didn't see this the next morning, really. You know what I mean? I mean, well, I mean, I saw it, but I didn't really want to post anything until the next morning. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, this kind of, this stuff right here is just funny to me, how people react. And I understand if you're a fan. I understand if you're, you know, who you support. That You do you, do you. But, um... I'm just a little, you know, I'm not upset. I'm not even mad, really. I'm just kind of surprised at the, the way people act. But maybe I shouldn't be because, you know, like I said, when you're a fan of somebody and you want to support them, you know what I mean? No matter what it is, whether it's right or whether it's wrong, you know what I mean? You're going to, you're going to support them, you know what I mean? Until death almost, I guess. And that's, and that's great. But like I said, some of these people that should be respected in boxing, some of these, uh, these, these, these radio and TV personalities to say the stuff that they're saying. And I mean, some of them not even fighters. You got the nerve. You know what I mean? Look what position you're in. You're doing stuff on TV talking. You ain't throwing a punch. You ain't, you ain't got nothing on you. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying there's not pressure in your field. But what I am saying is you don't got to worry about none of that stuff that I got to worry about. Not the, not the same things anyway. So you got to have a little bit more respect when you open your mouth before you actually say certain things about me when you don't know me. And you don't understand the situation because you're not in it. You understand? Really, that's all. But it's just it's just a little annoying. And I'm not mad. I'm, I swear. I know it may seem that way, but I'm really not mad. It's just venting a little bit of the disappointment that I have in some of these people. I'm just disappointed, you know, in, in how these people are acting. When if the shoe was on the other foot, they would just be in a total different in a total different way. It's like I've watched different things. I've watched TV shows and, you know, there people would be sitting there and if somebody found, you know, a thousand dollars or something and they got it out of an ATM that maybe was broken and it come out of somebody else's account. They say, oh, I would give it back. I would give it back. Then all of a sudden, right? When they find out that it was the person that they were talking to, they go, like, oh no, hold on to that. Maybe give me a couple of hours. You know what I'm saying? It's like, well, damn. Didn't you just say I should have took the high road? Now you're telling me I should spend it or give some to you? And that's how these people are acting. And I just feel it's a little bit hypocritical. You know what I mean? I think these people are a little bit hypocritical, especially the people that actually should be backing me in this. And I'm not asking for you to do that. I'm just saying it's just a little funny how these people are. And it's cool because they see me seeing a guy in his position and me trying to make a name off it. Like I can give a flying fornication about the situation in the, in the position he's in. I don't want nothing to do with it. Unless he wants to, unless he wants to fight or something, I, it's, I'm good over here. Trust me when I tell you that. I don't need that. You know what I mean? I'm enjoying my life outside of it. So I just wanted to say that. You know what I mean? That's all. Just wanted to say that a little bit of that. And that, that that's all. I'm good. Go ahead, Joe.
No, I just want to kind of jump in um, on that subject. Obviously, you know, I I, I knew I was going to be mentioning this subject, whether whether or not you was going to be here or not. And first, firstly, just just to kind of reiterate what you said there. Mm-hmm. Obviously, some of the comments that people have been sending to you, you know, yeah. some some of the, the names you've been called by, you know, these people that don't know you. I mean, obviously, you don't deserve that. Anybody that has met you, I speak to many. I mean. You wouldn't even be on this thing if you was, you know, if you wasn't a, a good guy. You would say, "No, I haven't got the time right. to, to do this podcast." You know, everybody that I speak yeah. to that's met you, everybody speaks highly of you. Obviously, you're a nice guy. My listeners should know that anyway. Um, but yeah, just talking about the thing as it kind of unfolded. So, so I was so heavily involved on, you know, in this on Twitter um, when it all kind of broke out. And what happened is obviously, you know, I was on Twitter and Dave Allen actually posted a tweet saying did anybody see Eddie Chambers recent tweet on Instagram so when I saw that I thought what's what's going on there so I shot over to 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 your Instagram Eddie then I saw obviously some some kind of screenshot of some direct messages between you and Anthony Joshua it was just one screenshot it was basically him kind of saying um how did it start again he he said like, you're a little bitch never forget it or something like that right and then you said like sorry say again he said, you're a little bitch. Remember that. That's what it said. Right. That's- and then you kind of commented back saying like, what? Why are you saying that? Blah, blah, blah. And that was all there was. And then obviously the first thing I did was rung you up and said, what the hell is going on here? And you <laughs> said to me, at that point, obviously you said he's replied to what I've said, but I don't even want to post what he said because, you know, I'm not that kind of guy. Right. That's what you said. So. Again, that was that was an example that some people may not know, but that's the kind of person you are. You didn't really want to post something negative about yeah. him because you knew that he shouldn't have put it out there in the first place. So anyways, um, obviously a lot of people don't know that sometimes it's not you on your account. Sometimes you've got people handling your account for you. Um, you know, in the end, after some people saying, you know, it's fake, it's fake, Eddie Chambers is just trying to look for a payday, He's, yeah. his career is over, he's just looking for a payday. Obviously, the second part of the message got posted. Now, this part was when people really, and I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna say a bad well, a bad word as well. They really lost their their shit. You know, like they were they were really like, whoa, he said something racist. Obviously, he said that you're a disgrace to the superior black race, which. As I know, and as you acknowledged, you know, saying that one race is superior than the other, no matter which race it is, is obviously a racist term. Um, Once you did that, people were then saying, oh, there's a space in between. They were basically saying Anthony underscore Joshua, which is Anthony Joshua's Instagram. They were saying that that it looked like it was Anthony space underscore Joshua. And the reason people were saying that was because on your phone, which is a Samsung, yeah. It, it, the font on the phone is different to the font of an iPhone. So right. even right. though it says the same thing, because of the J on Joshua, it loops round to the left and it's closer to the underscore in the middle than right. Right. Um, than the Y is on the end of Anthony. So it looks like there's a tiny little gap there. But, of course, you can't even have a space in, in the middle of a, a username on Instagram. So right. anyway... Eddie Hearn even commented saying it's fake, there's a space there. And then, you know, I was saying, no, 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 you know, it's because it's on two different phones. And then someone, I can't remember her name, it was a girl, she very kindly went onto Instagram on her Samsung and screenshotted Anthony Joshua's page and posted it and said, no, he's right. It looks like there's a space there on my phone. It's just the way it's set up. Now, right. everyone was saying to me, we still don't believe him, blah, blah, blah. And I said, look, I just got off the phone to Eddie. He's not lying to me. And they're like, yep, he's lying, he's lying. Get him to post a video, clicking on the DM. So what did I do? I rung you up, Eddie. I said, listen, Eddie, just post this video to, you know, to, to make sure everybody believes you now. You know, yeah. all the all the, all the uh, accusations that were being thrown at everybody would all go away. Then, because you probably took about two hours to do it, because you was in the gym, you know, you, you're right. not even paying attention to what's going on on social media. Everyone's right. commenting on, you know... To, <laughs> Everyone's attacking me, saying like, oh, where's your boy? I thought he was going to post this thing. Ah, it's all lies, it's all lies. Anyway, you finally post it, okay? So you posted it, you did an Instagram live video, people were there. Anthony Joshua even tuned in to watch it, but didn't say anything. Everybody finally believed you. You put the video on Twitter, everybody believed you. Now, 
like funny enough, even today, which is you know it's been a, it's been over a week now. I think no, it's not right, over a week, but right. it's been a, it's been a few days. Oh, even right. today, some people are still writing that it's fake. Some people are still like liking Eddie Hearn's comment when he said that there's a space in there because Eddie Hearn's got so many followers. But if you actually pay attention to the whole thing, even the next day, people were saying to me, "Ah, see, just another podcast trying to you know pretend that they've got exclusive news." And I was just laughing at these comments because I was thinking, look, I'm not trying to kind of say I've got any exclusive news. Just that Eddie's my friend. That's all it is. I wasn't trying to, you know, it was it was funny, some of the things I was receiving. But anyways. Um, Sorry, you had to go through that too. <laughs> no, no, it's, listen, I just saw people attacking you. And obviously I'm like, look, I can't stand for that. <laughs> so I just oh, had to give some oh, back. It's just crazy, man. It's crazy. But it's, hey, look. It, it was crazy. It's but like, let me just quickly say, Eddie but, Hearn, I know that he's done an interview for iFilm London. I know that he did an interview yesterday. So surely, I haven't watched it yet, but surely it must have been brought up. If it wasn't brought up, then I know that obviously Eddie Hearn must have said, look, I'm not talking about that, so don't ask me about that. But it, they had to have brought it up because it is, apparently Joshua is of the topic. So I might have to check that out. And if anything, I'll let you know what gets said. But yeah, it was madness, but we all now know that... It was not any kind of hack or any kind of Photoshop. Honestly, some of the people that, that were you know throwing these accusations, Eddie Chambers wouldn't have a clue how to work Photoshop to save his life, <laughs> to be true. honest. True. That is true. And, um, true. and yeah, you know, obviously another theory that he got hacked and all these things. And, and, you know, some people don't look close enough to find out that he sent one of the messages, the first message saying, you know, you're a bitch and all these things. He sent that message on like the Monday or something. And then you replied and then he replied again on Thursday. So it went on about three or four days. I actually had one guy. I actually can't remember his username, but I'd like to shout him out because this guy, he was the one saying, yeah, where's this video then? You said he's going to post this video. When you ended up posting the video, I said to him, look, here's the video. Then he said to me, ah, I think Anthony Joshua, was, he, he must have just sent the, the, you know, the message when he was drunk. And I said, okay, so he's been drunk for about four days then, yeah? And he went, no, no, no. He went, no, no, I was just joking. Maybe he got robbed. And I'm like, okay, six foot six, Anthony Joshua, heavyweight champ. He got robbed for his phone. And he's tweeting and he's Instagramming in between being robbed. Okay, mate. I just didn't know what to say. But, but this is some of the... The idiots, I'm going to call them. This is some of the idiots that, that are actually on Twitter. Once once again, Eddie, I've always said this about, about these social media things. Social media gives nobodies a platform to be somebody's. Yeah, Preach. Yeah. 100%. And it's like... Preach. It's like- I'm seeing it, 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 you know, definitely pre. But yo, you know what? I'm just seeing it, and it's unbelievable. And it's like, dog, like I've done some things in boxing. I'm not happy with everything I've done. I've wanted to be a world champion. I wanted to make more money. Yeah, I still am at it. I still want to go down and wait. I'm still excited about trying things. But it's all about that. It's about the sport for me now, more so than the business. I'm just trying to enjoy it because I feel like if you enjoy it, you'll do better. You'll, 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 you'll you're the, that this part of my career will turn into something a lot better you know what i mean and this to come up i didn't even want nothing like this to come up i wanted to fly under the radar straight up i wanted to be close to the river you know what i mean where you can't see me because of the wave that's where i wanted to be i don't want anybody to see anything but the problem is these people honey these people are really really just kind of coming out of woodwork with this and, it, and it's almost pulling me back into something that i really don't even want to be a part of at this point i just want to go ahead and do my own thing on the side and let them people go ahead and, and do them and if i see them later great but right now i'm just trying to do me and then i gotta do this and then you deal with all the hate i'm not mad I'm really not mad. I even laughed at some of the stuff that Ant told me that was popping up on there had me dying in the gym. I was legitimately laughing like they were talking about somebody else because I don't really care for that stuff. That stuff doesn't bother me. But it's just it's just surprising. It's just surprising. Yeah, it is. You know that that somebody like me, you know, like I know me, <laughs> you know, of course I know me, and I'm and most of the people that know me, they just know that I'm not really for anything like this, and it just surprises me. And it's like I see I see people like literally that aren't that far away from me saying this, I'm like dude, dude, I might actually even see you one day. What would you do then? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like like come on, you know what I mean? And I'm not even like that, but I'm just saying, you know what I mean? You see guys like um, I hate to even mention this, but you see guys like Charlie Zelenar, right? <laughs> I know y'all know about him. And all the mouth and all him running his mouth and all that stuff that he that he actually. I'm not sure that I'm not sure that that's the real Charlie Zelenoff on Twitter though. 
No, no, no. I'm not even talking about him. I'm not even talking. I'm just talking about when he got caught up. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When he caught Deon- Yeah, when he caught Wilder. Say Wilder. You understand what I'm saying? Like, you... You understand that some of the things you say, being that you know you're dealing with certain people, you never know what's gonna happen. You never know what paths you crawl. So you gotta tread carefully. And I'm not saying you can go ahead and be a keyboard warrior. I'm not even gonna approach anybody, even if I knew it was you or somebody that said it. I'm not even gonna acknowledge that you exist. But have a little respect. You've not, and most of the people that's done that are that are that are complimenting haven't done sh- squat. As an athlete or as a person, they just live everyday life, live check to check. That's what they do. So don't come at me for trying to better myself and put myself in an opportunity to actually do something. And I'm not asking for no handout. I want the opportunity. You know what I'm saying? That would be great to have an opportunity to be in the ring with the world champion again. No doubt about it. But I'm not trying to get it for free. I'm not just trying to all of a sudden fall into that money. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying I'll, I'll work for it. You know what I mean? Whatever you need me to do. If, if fight before, whatever. I don't care. But what I am saying is that the disrespect is really unwarranted. It really is. I mean, people don't know me. People don't understand the situation. And then more importantly, even if it was that, what would they do? What would all these people who are chiming in and saying all this crap from their, from their couch or from their phone or from their keyboard, wherever they are, what would you do? That's the question I post. What would you do? Yeah, and just to, just to kind of... Um, yeah, just to sort of move on from this subject. But the last thing I just want to say... Obviously, you know, people people should know if they've listened to this this podcast before. Obviously, you've always kind of been on from time to time anyway. You've already you've always said for quite a while now, for, for probably about a year and a half, your plans have been to lose weight and move down to cruiserweight. You was well you're 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 weighing at the moment very, very close to being a cruiserweight. So that's been your goal for a long, long time. Um, you know, and, and some people kind of saying, Oh no, he's he's just trying to get a big fight here. No. Do you do you seriously you think Eddie Chambers is gonna, you know, lose all that weight and work so hard to try and be cruiserweight, and then just to make up some? Why would he lose the weight? He's got to fight a heavyweight if he's gonna fight, um, you know, Anthony Joshua. Why would he put himself through all that hard work? You know, you should see some of his recent posts. You see that, you know, he looks half the 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 guy that he he was when he was over here, for example, fighting a heavyweight in terms of weight. You know, he's he's really been been working hard, and. Um, and the final thing as well, Eddie, that I want to say, I even said to you myself, and, and, you know, not just myself, but people around you said, okay, this, you know, Anthony Joshua said something to you now. Now, if you turn around and do a video and, you know, say this and start, you know, um, attacking him and saying bad things about him and all these things, you can probably have a chance of really heating things up and probably have a better chance of getting the fire instead of just sitting there going, oh, you know, was it really him? Uh, you know, you know, like the way you are. You're so humble that if you were truly trying to chase a big fight, you'd be doing some Shannon Briggs crap right now. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. And people, people around you, people around you, kind of, including myself. You know, I, I know that that's what you'd have to do to get it. But you, you know, you, it was clear in your actions that you were not trying to brew up some kind of, you know, fake grudge match. It was just simply you got a message. You wanted to know what it was about. That was it. He yeah. didn't do anything else, but it's mad, it's mad, it's mad. Boxing fans, they are amongst some of the best and some of the most craziest people on earth. But um, 100%. <laughs> moving on now to the previewing, though. Wow, this is a funny one, Eddie. As I said just before we went on air, over in Germany, Saturday night at the Oberhausen. Top of the bill, Manuel Char, 30-4. and four. I don't think he's had a fight for... A long time. I can't even remember when he last fought. He's fighting Alexander Ustinov, who's thirty-four and one. Last time I saw Alexander Ustinov in a ring, it was a Frank Warren show. It was at a hotel. It was a real small hall kind of show. One of those ones where you can, you know, sit in the front row with a table on and you're all suited and booted. Anyway, he knocked out a guy called um it was that guy who Joshua knocked out again. I forget his name. His name was um something love. Um Oh, what's his name? Anyway, Joshua knocked him out in like two rounds. Alexander Ustinov knocked him out in the first round, if I'm not mistaken. It was Rafael Zumbano, love. Anyway, these two guys, God knows how, but they're fighting for the vacant WBA world heavyweight title. I think Ustinov was quite highly ranked with the WBA, but Manuel Chara had no idea he was anywhere near the top 15. But boy, oh boy, it's happening. And on Saturday night or on Sunday morning, someone is going to be crowned the new world champion. Obviously, 
obviously the full WBA super champion is Anthony Joshua, but we will see here the regular belt go to one of these guys. It's a bizarre situation, Eddie. It's, uh, I'm sure fights like this kind of make you kick yourself a little bit. It does, and it's and it's funny. There's something like this is going on on the back of what the situation with me and Anthony Joshua is going on, and they're coming at me and not looking at things that are just literally bang right in your face. I mean, some people maybe don't even know about this fight that, that is even going on. But I mean, to have something to say about what I'm doing, if if I'm even doing it, then you see something like this on the back end. What if I was put in the same situation as Manuel Char? Well, would kind of wish then. I can't, I can't, no, I was just going to say, I kind of wish that Manuel Char or Ustinov didn't send you that DM instead. Yeah, it would have been. Only thing is, I'm good, well, well, Ustinov would have been more likely, but Manuel Char, is, I'm actually good with him. I like him, he's a good guy, and I met him on, on several different occasions. He's a nice guy, no, but I'm just saying, in the situation... You met Ustinov as well, though, right? Yeah, I did, I did. It was, I, we, they were actually entertaining the idea of a fight with him, you know, because when uh, Tyson, you know, his uncle passed, and he wasn't going to be able to fight, um, we were actually thinking about covering for that, and we were going to, and then we ended up, they ended up, they ended up uh, saying, never mind, no, nah, we don't need that, you know what I mean, and moved on, but, yeah, you know, it's just... It's just so funny, you know, the, how things play out in these uh, in this sport, man. And it's it's part of the reason why a lot of people would, you know, there's there's people that's following now. It's getting a little more uh, momentum now, but it's just it's reason why it's hard to get fans that are, you know, are, are the the lay fan and, and interested because there's just so much controversy, uh, negative controversy, things that black eye the sport. You understand what I'm saying? And it and it just makes it difficult. You focus on something like what's going on with me and Anthony Joshua, and you want to come at one of us or come at me or uh, you know, and even even coming at him in it. In, in any way for his comments, but then you look at something like this that the sport is being built on a lot of these types of fights that are coming and just basically trying to set up a guy for a title. You know what I mean? Maybe not even deserving of it, but this is going on constantly. But nobody wants to say anything about that. I mean, it maybe it is you know talked about at times, but it needs to be brought to the forefront more so than something that adds very little controversy, like what's going on with me and Anthony Joshua. I mean, it's ridiculous. And. I don't know if you knew this, but I saw a video. This oh, this was a few months ago now, though. But um, Tyson Fury was in a, in in some country in Europe. I can't remember where it was, but Manuel Char got right in Fury's face, and you know Fury was out of shape and all that, like he still is at the moment. But he, um, yeah, he got right in his face, and and you know Tyson kind of thought he was joking. I think maybe tried to shake his hand or whatever, and Manuel Char kind of. I don't know, all security had to stop him and all things like that. I mean, Fury was just kind of at this place, like, just in a good mood and all that, and Manuel Char come over, and that kind of put me off him a little bit. So I don't yeah, know if you've yeah. seen that video. Have you seen it? No, no I haven't no, seen it, no. You probably, know what? Go on. You know, I, 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 no, I mean, I, I can see how that can happen, especially if you think, you know what I mean, there's an opportunity maybe for a fight down the line or something. I don't know, maybe. I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, these guys, some guys are just more into trying to sell these things than I am. So, I mean, maybe maybe that's what it was, or maybe he was just angry at him for something. But I, I yeah, I, I, Tyson, like I said, man, Tyson's a good guy. You know what I mean? He he, he may not, he may rub some people the wrong way, but I know him personally. And in fans, I mean, any fans of his or even anybody that's supporting him, even ones that don't, nine times out of ten, they have a different view of him after they meet him and they get a chance to really find out really what he's what he's really about so it's kind of shocking you know what i mean especially from another fighter with the exception of his opponent you know what i mean obviously i can understand why some of the opponents would have a little bit of an attitude with him you know what i mean because of some of the, tra- the trash talk and stuff like that and you know how he beats the heck out of him maybe that part has a little bit to do with it but with this with the exception of that man he's a good dude you know what i mean you gotta you gotta give him that you know yeah absolutely absolutely um yeah, just to try to move through this a little bit quicker now. We don't want to be stalling on, on, on this talk too much. But um, what I was going to say, I was going to say one last thing about um, Manuel Cha. Um, yeah, I remember, basically, I remember when, when um, David Hay was going to fight Derek Chisora, there was a press conference, and Manuel Char turned up at the press conference, and nobody knew who he was, and then he, he kind of broke through security. And I remember he, he got right like almost on the actual top table and he was like I want to fight you next I fight you next and then David Hay actually said like who are you and he was like you know I'm Manuel Char like you know but literally nobody knew who he was and that was kind of the first time that British fans were like oh okay this guy's Manuel Char I look him up I think he was unbeaten at the time and then um 
there was a time I think where David Hay was lined up to fight Manuel Chai. If I'm not mistaken, yeah, that was going to happen at one point yeah, as well yeah. after the Chisora fight. Um, and then he ended up, you know, David Hay. That was one of his fights that fell through before he signed to fight Tyson Fury, and then of course that fell through twice. But yeah, he was actually supposed to fight him at one point, but it never happened. And I think he ended up losing Char. Um, to, to Vitaly Klitschko, I think it was his first loss, if I'm not mistaken. I'm just going yeah. by memory. Yeah. Um, right, anyway, that's the 12 round. I'm moving over now to Thailand. There's a guy on here, Eddie. Um, his name is Chayafon Moonstree. He's 48 and 0. He's the WBC World Minimum Weight Champion. I'm really hoping that he wins this fight and hopefully wins his next couple of fights so he overtakes Mayweather with the 50, <laughs> you know, the 50 streak. I've I've got no idea what he looks like, anything. I've never seen him fight. I've never even really heard of him till this week. But yeah, that's incredible. 48 and 0. He takes on a guy called Tatsua. Oh gosh. How am I going to say this last name? Tatsuya. His last name is Fukuhara, which you can actually, if you spaced it up, it literally says, fuck you, hurrah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, his record's 19 and 5 with six draws. Six draws, that's mad. And um, it's a 12 rounder, of course. So all the very best of luck to Chayafon Moonsri. Hopefully, he's 49 and 0 this time next week, and he will equal the Rocky Marciano. Um, record, which a lot of people have found it very hard to equal. Anyway, moving over now to the Doncaster Dome in Doncaster, Yorkshire. This one, a Steffi Ball promotion in the United Kingdom, of course. One fight or two fights to mention on this bill. Curtis Woodhouse, 23 and 7, returns to the ring. He takes on Lewis Van Pooch, who's, well, he's a journeyman, really. He's 7 and 55 with one draw. Um, Top of the bill, though, a decent fight, a little bit of a trade fight here. Uh, Maxi Hughes, 17 and 3 with two draws, takes on Danny Cassius Connor, who's 17 and 9 with two draws. I know that Danny Cassius Connor's wanted a big fight for a long time. This one's a 10 rounder. No belt on the line, which I'm a little bit surprised about, but all the very best to both men in that one. Moving over now to the Mohegan Sun Casino in Connecticut, USA. Um, there is one fight on this bill that I thought we should mention. It's, it's funny, because whenever we get you on the show, Eddie, this yeah. guy's always fighting. So in one corner, there's a guy, he's a Southpaw. His name's Konstantin Begeneru. He's 12-0. and 0. He's the WBC Continental America's Cruiserweight Champion. He's also the WBC International Cruiserweight Champion. He takes on Tabiso Machunu in a 10-rounder. <laughs> of course, Machunu 18-3. and three. I, haven't, I haven't heard anything of this Konstantin Begeneru. Begeneru, but he's the champion. He's undefeated. As I said, he's a southpaw. Um, have you heard anything about him at all? No, no. This is the first time, man. It's the first time I heard something about him. You know what I mean? I, it is funny how how um, June is always fighting <laughs> when I'm doing a podcast. It's like he's just haunting me, like <laughs> like a bad, it's like a bad dream right now. No. Yeah, I always, I always wish he, I always hope that he loses when I see that he's fighting. It's really bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what though? And and a fight that we had, it was it was bad in the sense that it was just more skill and trying we were trying to figure each other out, you know what I mean? And I just wasn't sharp as I needed to be. And he was on his game, you know, and he figured out how to find a way. And he fig- how figured out how to find a way. He found a way to win without putting himself in too much danger. You know what I mean? And me also trying to fight on the back foot while I press him was difficult because I'm not used to that style. You understand what I'm saying? So it kind of threw the situation. And it really made it like um, it was like a like, how do I put it, it like a, a stalemate in most in most in most parts of the round. And then he may throw a few more, land a couple, or maybe not land any, but just was more active. And then he wins the rounds. You know what I'm saying? The rounds weren't like super wide, but you know when he's the only one doing work and I'm trying to figure things out and trying to dominate, it's just not gonna happen. You gotta be. That's what I try to tell some of the guys that I work with too when I train with them and train them is that you gotta be okay sometimes with only winning the round by a little bit if you can. You know what I mean? You just gotta put extra work in. So I just. I wasn't able to do it that night, and that's why it turned out the way it did. And let me ask you this, Eddie. This is a little bit of a penetrating question, actually, and I just want to give you 30 seconds before we move on to something. For those people that may have seen that fight between yourself and Machunu, that's, of course, your, uh, you know, the only fight you've had at Cruiserweight. You're trying to go back down to Cruiserweight. People may watch that performance and go... Man, you know, what can you do now at Cruiserweight if you weren't good enough to beat Machunu that night? What things can you do differently to be a much better fighter than the Eddie Chambers we saw that night? 
one thing is for sure I could definitely prepare better. You know what I mean? Like I was in good shape. You know what I mean? I made the weight. I, I felt great. The problem was that that doesn't necessarily mean that you're just going to equal great results if you're not sharp. You know what I mean? I'm sharp-ish. You know what I mean? All the time when I throw punches, they you know they tend to land a lot. You know what I mean? I, they, you know I'm, I'm good on pads. I'm good with sparring. I'm good with the fights. Ninety nine point nine percent of the time. However, if you're not paired and for someone and if for, and this guy, I haven't there wasn't a lot of video on him. You know what I mean? He was five foot eight. You know what I mean? At cruiserweight, two hundred pounds. He's very low to the ground. He fought in a way where I had to put everything on the line while he just took what was available. And not only that, you got people behind you pushing you. You got to knock this guy out. You got to knock this guy out. That kind of pressure makes you look for that only. You're only looking for the spectacular. You're not looking to win the fight. You're looking to knock a guy out and dominate the fight. That's not how boxing is. That's not how that's not how fights are won. Fights are won by doing what you do, handling business round by round. And if the knockout comes, it comes. But the way that you're being, if you're pushed a certain way, you know what I mean? Sometimes it just doesn't work out. And if that's all you're looking for, you can get stuck. You can be in quicksand. Where the harder you work at something, it continues to go down the hole. And that's exactly what happened. But now... I'm going to prepare like I'm a cruiserweight and like I'm a lighter weight fighter. I'm not going to prepare like a heavyweight. I was sparring still with heavyweights at that point. I was so much faster than the guys I was in the ring with that I wasn't even prepared mentally at all for if he was fast at all. You understand? Or sharp at all. You know what I mean? All I was looking at was, uh, okay, well, I'm a lot faster than the guys I'm in the ring with. And hopefully that's the case when I get in there and fight. And that's just not going to work. Got to get in there with... A, with the guys at a different pace that are moving at a different pace than you in order to get get on that same level. That's what I had with Tomas, and that's why the results turned out the way they did, even though I lost. You know, and I was much better prepared for picking up the speed, and and that's the difference in the fight. That would that was should have been the difference in the fight, but in the case of the cruiserweight, wasn't prepared like I needed. To be. However, it was his night. I'm not taking that away from. Him. I'm moving over now to Madison Square Garden. The, uh, the theater though this one in new york usa Ooh. this one's going to be on hbo um a couple fights to mention on this bill firstly sullivan barrera 20 and one a guy that you know really and truly i think i don't know if he's really being managed correctly in my opinion i mean or promoted correctly i think that he's kind of like uh, you know like they say there's this club in boxing it's like the who needs him club i think he's like the star member of that because he's just a guy that you know, he's a hard man to beat. Um, obviously, you know, a Cuban. And he's, he's a tough, tough guy. I mean, you know, he gets up off the floor and wins. He's he, he can punch a bit himself. And he's just a real tough guy. I mean, the only loss, of course, coming to Andre Ward. But no, I mean, he, he just... Like, he, he should have been really fighting for, I think, one of the vacant belts. I think, in the end... Um, Dimitri Bivol ended up fighting that guy um, Trent Broadhurst who was ranked like 11th or whatever and he really should have got the call for that so I don't really know what's going on with him but I feel quite sorry for him, his English is terrible uh, sometimes he tries to tweet on Twitter like his frustration and it just don't even make any sense so I do feel for him but yeah he's 20 and 1 he takes on Felix Valera who I think may have been an Olympian. I'm not quite sure, but Felix Valera can can punch as well. He is 15 and one. Um, that should be a really really good fight. Um, did you say something there, Eddie? No, no, no. I'm just listening, my man. No, yeah, no, yeah. That should be a really good fight. That's a 10 rounder. Also, a fight on this bill that. Um, is quite intriguing for me here. Jason Sosa, a man that's been on the show before, of course, former world champion, 20-2 and two with four draws. He was supposed to be fighting somebody that I've completely forgotten who, and he's now fighting a little bit of a late replacement. He's had a couple weeks to prepare for him, I suppose. Yoriorkis Gamboa, who a lot of people would say is well past it. He's not really looked himself recently, but, you know, it's it's very hard to kind of you know, be prepared for one man and then Yuri Orkis Gamboa, no matter what kind of shape he's in or where he is at in his career, it's very hard to kind of prepare for him in in, in a quick change, if you like. Obviously, Yuri Orkis Gamboa, 27-2. and two. Um, Yeah, I think that's a tough... I actually think that's a tougher fight than some people believe it is. I think maybe Jason Sosa wins, probably on points. But mm -hmm. I think that's a tough, tough fight, Eddie. Have you got any kind yeah. of opinion on that? Well, uh, Gamboa, he's... 
He's just, he was so explosive in his heyday, and I'm not saying he's past it. I mean, I don't know. A lot of people say the same thing about me, so I'm not going to start, you know, extending no, that. he's past it, though. He's, he's past it, I think. Maybe, but who knows, man? Sometimes you get time away, man, and you just you get a chance, a chance to reflect. You heal up. You know, maybe there was a lot of injuries that we didn't know about. A lot of people don't speak on him. You know what I mean? He's not speaking a lot of English, so, so we don't really know. You know what I mean? And and maybe he's ready to go in there and perform. You know, what I mean, I, I'm pretty, I'm pretty, pretty sure. You know, Jason gonna get in there and win, and maybe even stop him. You know, possibly. But at the same time, you never know. You know what I mean? That's why it's tough with late replacements and things like they don't know when you don't really know a lot about what you're facing. You know what I mean? Most people say he's past it, man. I've had people come into the gym and spar with me and think I, I didn't have nothing left, and they leave out, you know, lumped up like. Damn, Dang, I thought he was. I thought he was done, and then all of a sudden, that's what, that's what happens, man. They don't. You don't. You don't know until you get in there. You know what I mean? So this can be. A, this can turn out and actually be a tougher fight than he expected. So you know, just ex- expect him to win, no doubt about it. But <laughs> don't be shocked if it's a tougher fight than, than most would have thought. Yeah, yeah, I think it, it will be quite tough, but I think. Sosa, I mean, even though he lost last time out to Lomachenko, that's another thing. He's coming off a loss as well that kind of, you know, adds another little interesting piece to the puzzle. But I think even though he lost, he was, he was, he really impressed me with how elusive he was. He's, he's got a great defense, Sosa. He's very hard to hit clean. But yeah, I think, you know, I think he probably wins on points. Um, by the way, this one was one that we asked our listeners what they thought. Um, our listeners at the moment is actually at 31% for, for Sosa to win by knockout which is shocking, and the other 31% is Gamboa on points, so I'm going to have to give that a retweet just to kind of get an extra couple of votes just to make sure that there's a uh, you know definitive choice there, but right now it's looking like Sosa knockout or Gamboa points, so I'll give that a retweet, and by the end of the show, hopefully we will have a definitive choice. Um, I'm actually going to go with Sosa on points. Um, I... I've got to speak to Ayaz as well. Just before the show ends, I'm going to have to get his predictions as well. Um, So, yeah, we will rain check that one. Moving over now to... Where was I? Where was I? Moving over now to the main event. The main event. Sergei Kovalev, 30-2 with one draw. Of course, coming off of those two losses to Andre Ward. The most recent one was a stoppage loss. He takes on Vacheslav Shabransky, who's 19-1. Shabransky is... Um, I think he's a, quite a power puncher as well. I haven't seen too much of him, but his only loss is to Sullivan Barrera, who's on the undercard. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think this fight goes the distance. It's for the vacant IBA light heavyweight title and the vacant WBO world light heavyweight title. I didn't know that. Okay, so, um, yeah, Kovalev's fighting for one of his old belts that... Um, that um that Andre Ward gave up when he retired a few weeks back. So yeah, that's interesting. Um any kind of opinion on this, Eddie? Have you you probably haven't seen much of Shabransky, I'm guessing. No, no, I mean I just you know, I just feel like uh this is it's all about well he's like he's a power puncher, but being that he lost to Barrera, it's I mean I did, you know, styles make fights. We don't know what it'll turn out to be when he's in there with Kovalev and maybe Kovalev's taking a step back, you know what I mean? I mean sometimes you hear you hear things about certain guys and you know, whether they're willing to, you know, take advice from their corner and listen and, 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 and you don't know what they're gonna what you're gonna see when they get in the ring. You know what I mean? You have a corner for a reason, you have supporters there for a reason that's looking out for you. You know what I mean? So if you don't listen to him, you just go out there and do your own thing. Sometimes you're taking it in your hands and you know, if you can't see all you you don't see everything that the corner sees. You know what I mean? So you can't always rely on one particular thing that you have. Sometimes you gotta you gotta use your resources. You know what I mean? And if you have good ones in your corner, you gotta use them. You know what I mean? You can't go out there and think you go just knock everybody out because that's not how it works. You know, sometimes you might get dropped and you gotta figure out how to come back from it. You know what I mean? He's not used to coming back off coming coming off to you know coming back off of losses either. This is something he's he's dealing with now. So we're gonna see how he responds to that. I mean, maybe it's not gonna bother him at all, but maybe it is because he didn't look the same. After the first Andre War fight in this in the, in the last one, you understand what I'm saying? So we'll see. It's it's, it's still be a, a bit interesting, but of course, obviously, I'm favoring favoring Kovalev. Yeah, um, again, that's one that we've predicted on. I believe Kovalev wins by knockout. I'm pretty sure Ayers is going to say the same thing, but I'll have to check with him just to be sure. And our listeners believe that Kovalev will win by knockout also. Um, and nobody actually voted for Shabransky to win by any method. So. Definitely everybody, 100% of people going with Kovalev to get the win. That one, again, is going to be on HBO. Um, 
Yeah, you know, I mean, there's been some crazy things come out about you know come out about um, Kovalev since splitting up with John David Jackson. John David Jackson apparently has come out and said that Kovalev was drinking throughout mm. training camp. So uh, I don't know. I don't really. I don't know, Eddie. I mean, I don't want to spend again too much time talking about this, but I don't really think that not just Kovalev's trainer, but being a trainer to a fighter and even a fighter to a trainer, if mm-hmm. you if you split between, you know, for, for whatever reason, I don't really, I'm not really a fan of kind of going and spreading things, even if yeah, they are yeah. true. I don't think it's right to do that, in my opinion. I'm a bit disappointed in John David Jackson, if I'm honest. Yeah, no, 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 and I, and I get what you're saying, and I agree with that. It's like having a bad relationship and then going around and spreading rumors about the girl saying how much she did this, that, and the third. That's not good. It's not good. You're 100% right. However, you know, if for, for Kovalev, regardless of whether it got out or not, if it was true, you know, which I'm, you know, I'm inclined to believe is true, more it's about, you know, why people are splitting from him and not just that they are. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, from, you know, you hear he doesn't listen, he doesn't, you know, take advice, he doesn't, you know, he, he trains, I guess he trains hard, but, he, but he's doing other things that combat that, you know what I mean? And some trainers just can't deal with it after a while. And I mean, I would imagine any trainer just couldn't deal with it unless you're a yes man, which some guys are out here. You, know, you can get a couple yes men that'll sit in the corner and just tell you how great you are and let you get away with murder. And then all of a sudden you start losing fights and you wonder why. But the real ones, like it seems to be maybe John David Jackson is, and I think he was trainer with, um, uh, what's my man's name? I can't, I can't remember his name at the, at the time. Uh, I mean, at this time, but um, he was training with him before, and they also they both said the same thing. You know what I mean? And it wasn't, you know, I, I don't know if they're trying to make him look bad, but you know, they are saying that he's just not willing to listen and he's doing his own thing. And sometimes, you know, that makes it, and obviously that, well, not sometimes, all the time, that makes it really difficult for a trainer. And then if a guy starts losing, then they start blaming the trainer, and and in reality, it was probably the fighter. So yeah, yeah it's just a tough thing, tough situation. Hopefully he can. Uh, you know, get yourself together and go on in and win some fights and maybe stop drinking. You know what I mean? Yeah, hopefully so. Like I say, we hope that the rumors of him drinking aren't true. Um, I think he's now linked up with a Russian trainer. Um, so, of course, you know, they, they'll be able to communicate much better, I'd imagine. Um, there's also a funny story, just for any of our listeners, if, if you can find the YouTube video where Kovalev's promoter, um, Kathy Duver of Main Event, she talks about a situation which happened back back in Russia when Kovalev was a youngster and he actually had a fight with 10 guys. It's a really funny 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 um, story it actually happened because in russia there, it, you know there was it was snow everywhere it was snowing and he had a fight with 10 guys in the snow and it is absolutely <laughs> hilarious i'm actually going to try and reach out to kathy duva try to get her on the show and i'm going to make her tell us that story because it's so so golden anyways moving over now to this coming monday it's going to be monday the 27th of november a couple fights to mention on the monday it's a little bit random there's a fight happening over in russia in moscow um a couple of fights to mention on this bill. Edward Troyanovsky, he's 26 and 1, of course, a uh, the, you know former world champion, actually. He lost the belt to Julius Indongo. Um, you know, he got stopped in the first round. Indongo, of course, went on to beat Ricky Burns and then went on to lose against Terence Crawford most recently. Anyway, um, Troyanovsky here takes on... Carlos Manuel Portillo, who's 21 and oh, I haven't heard anything about him, but that seems like a bit of a, you know, a bit of a uh, hard fight there, a decent fight there that's happening in Russia. And the main event on that one, the vacant WBC international heavyweight titles at stake. There's a guy called Sergei Kuzmin. He's 11 and oh, and he takes on America's very own Amir Mansour, 23 and two with one draw. Amir Mansour, a guy that's well, I suppose he hasn't been around for a long, long time but of course he's he's getting up there i think he's 45 years old now eddie um wash wash i mean I, you probably don't know much about kuzmin i haven't really heard about him but like i say he's 11 and oh he's taking on amir mansour amir mansour traveling to russia should be quite a tough fight for amir yeah yeah i mean it's uh obviously they're bringing it over because they really believe in their guy you know amir's been you know he's out there he's been tested he's pretty much proven you know, to be, you know, at a, you know, at a pretty decent level, you know what I mean, as a heavyweight, even at the uh, nice age of 45, he's still out there able to uh, perform. So they must believe in their guy. He must be tough. He must be uh, pretty pretty darn good. And they may have, you know, they must you know, have have ideas of him going for a title in the next year, the next couple of years. So, you know, this is going to be a nice little stiff test for him. You know what I mean? If, if, if Amir is coming to fight and he's ready, he's in shape and he's, you know, he's not just going in there to make a couple of hours. You know, you never know. It could be an upset. You never know. 
Yeah, all the very best to both men there. May the best man win. And finally, the final bill to mention. It's also happening on Monday in London. I'm not quite sure where it's happening, but anyways, Sonny Edwards, the brother of Charlie Edwards. Anyway, Sonny Edwards is 5-0. and He's fighting for the vacant WBO European super flyweight title against Ross Murray who I don't know anything about but he's 6-0 and so hopefully that's a good fight that's a Frank Warren card there and also on the undercard Lerone Sniper Richards he's 9-0 and looking to move to 10-0 and his opponent's yet to be announced it's a 10 round of that one it's for the vacant WBO European super middleweight title so two WBO European titles on the line on that bill and that really wraps up the previewing um, I did say on last week's show that there'd be something that we'd be doing on this show that we've never done before and that thing will be coming up in the interview that I'm about to do in a moment well that I'm going to bring in in a moment I actually did it a couple of days ago um so what actually is going to happen in the interview I will be speaking to Tevin Farmer uh, that's what happened. I was speaking to Tevin Farmer. It's a good interview. And then um, when Billy Dibb, who eventually, Billy Dibb's actually, it's a funny situation. Let me just quickly give you a backstory. Billy Dibb is ranked, I think, like number two or number one in the um, in the IBF rankings. And for whatever reason, I think he picked up a cut in his, in his last fight. He wasn't able to fight for the vacant title. So Tevin Farmer's now taking on a guy from Japan. Um, and basically, whoever wins that fight, Billy Dibb will be the mandatory to fight them. So when Billy Dibb got wind that I was interviewing Tevin Farmer, he asked me could he jump on the interview and turn it into a freeway thing, and that will be coming up in just a moment. I recorded a couple of days ago, so yeah, it's good. For the first 10 minutes or so, it's good me talking to Tevin Farmer. Then when Billy Dibb comes in, they go at it a little bit. It's quite friendly. I won't say it's juicy or try to lie and get you to stay on the on the podcast and listen if you want to if you want to zone out now you can but no it's a good thing um when they're both talking there is a little bit of a sound um a little bit of an error in the sound but it's still you can still make out what everybody's saying so i just want to apologize in advance for the poor audio when billy dib does jump on it wasn't entirely my fault but i am the only one here to take the blame so uh yeah that will be quite good so stay tuned for that but as i say just before we bring that in it's now time to say goodbye to eddie chambers Of course, the former heavyweight world title challenger, but more importantly, my good friend Eddie. Thanks once again for filling eyes his shoes. It's always a pleasure doing a show with you. I really mean that. No problem, my man. You know, any any time for you, my man. And I, you know, I like the show. I'm I'm gonna be a regular. So anytime you need me on, just holler. Thank you so much, Eddie. Right, just before we wrap up part two and ultimately end the show, there's one last thing to do, and that, of course, is to welcome. Guest number two that will be followed by guest number three it will be a funny one. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the soon-to-be super featherweight IBF world title challenger, Mr. Tevin Farmer. Tevin, it's been a long time since we last spoke. Welcome back, my friend. Yeah, thank you, man. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure, sir. It's my pleasure. So, Tevin, we last spoke on the week of the Orlando Rizzo fight, so quite a while ago now, of course you won that fight comfortably, you then defended your NABF title against Darden Zenujaj, uh, then then of course you went on to win very comfortably uh, in that fight. Uh, you, you ended last year on a high really, and this year you've just fought the once, it was against Arturo Santos Reyes, in which you beat him unanimously over 10 rounds. Do you want to comment on any of, on any of those fights at all before we move on? Uh. Yeah, I ain't really got nothing to say about the fight. I mean, I fought him, I beat him, and you know, we here now. And of course, all three fights mentioned there, you, you know, you went the distance, which is very important for a for a big fight coming up. Of course, like you do have. Now, obviously, I can't help really but bring up the fact that earlier this year, outside the ring, you had some issues. Uh, which of course um, led to you being shot, and of all places to be shot, you got shot in your hand. Firstly, Tevin, what the hell happened there? <laughs> I mean, I don't really speak. On, I don't really like speaking about that incident, but um, it was. It, I was at a um, I was at a family gathering. You know, things happened, and I got shot in my head, and you know, it happened. It is what it is. I moved forward from that. I I, I don't really like to speak on it, but I'm okay now. No, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, I won't. I won't ask you any more kind of penetrating questions. But what I will say is, was it a graze or or did a bullet go in and out your hand? How severe was it, Tevin? No, it went. It went in and out. It went in and out. Yeah, okay, it, it went, went, it went in and out. Yeah. 
Oh, wow. And, of course, you couldn't punch or you couldn't even put on a glove for quite a while. How long did it last for, Tevin, not being able to put a pair of gloves on? I couldn't even close my hair. Oh, how long yeah, did it last for? Yeah, I couldn't close for? my hair at all. I'm not quite sure. I think I started closing my hair about, I started to close it like around September. I mean, I was in therapy. I was doing therapy at home and then I was going to therapy. And, you know, I was just really strict on it, making sure I do everything to get it back to where it is. And I actually think that it, it healed pretty fast due to my determination. Yeah, credit to yourself for that, man. Credit to yourself. Now, on the back of on the back of an awful situation outside the ring regarding the shooting, some good news was waiting for you around the corner. You're now going to be fighting for the vacant IBF World Super Featherweight title against uh, Kenichi Ogawa. Do you know much about him, Tevin? I actually don't. I actually just heard of him when they mentioned him, but um, as I, as I look into him, I just know that he's a tough he's a tough fighter. And he coming to fight, and he going, he he definitely coming. He's not coming to lay down. He, he he's coming to take my head off. Yeah, he's got quite a punch on him as well. His record currently stands at twenty-two and one with seventeen knockouts. The only loss on his record came by knockout, and it was to a guy called Yuki Miyoshi. It was back in twenty twelve, but they actually had a rematch in twenty thirteen, and Ogawa knocked him out in the first round. So he kind of, you know, even though he he's not undefeated, so to speak, he's he has beaten every man he's been in a professional ring with. So. Uh, credit to him for that. Now, I know that at times of your career, Tevin, going back quite a while now, actually, but there was times where you weren't really motivated. He wasn't really taking boxing too seriously. Of course, you've had to do things the yeah. hard way. Nothing's been handed to you. However, this fight is happening in the United States. Thankfully, you didn't have to travel to Japan. How motivated are you for this fight, Tevin? Oh, I'm happy as hell, man. All my hard work definitely paid off. Well, it definitely paid off. And you know, it's going to be on HBO, the Cobain event, and I'm just happy to to be a part of that, to be a part of the HBO um, squad. You know, the the most the most um, all the legends has fought on HBO. HBO is a platform, is a big boxing platform, and I'm happy to be there. And we're going to go get the job done, like I've been doing. And you say there that it's the co-main event. What is the main event, Tevin? Because I thought it was the main. No, I'm just called Orlando Salido is the uh, main event. Ah, right, okay, okay. And of course, the previous holder of this title that you're fighting for was Javante Davis. He lost the belt on the scales when he came in overweight for his defense on the Mayweather-McGregor undercard. You two seem like you're not the best of friends, Tevin. Is that fair to say? Yeah, that's 100%. What What really started all that all that stuff there? I mean, I'm not really interested in talking about him. I mean... Right now, this is about me, and this, he 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 had an opportunity. He had his little shine, and he 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 messed up. So, um, you can scratch him off in this interview. Okay, okay. Um, I mean, I, I wanted to 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 really ask you, to be honest, uh, to be honest, Tevin. I know that, of course, you're you're mainly focused on Ogawa here. But there was a, a situation before where you really wanted a fight, and obviously Javante was the champion. Now the tables have turned. You're going to be hopefully picking up his belt, and he's now calling you out. Yeah. And it just seems like you're basically saying, "No, what goes around comes around." I'm not going to be giving you a shot. You can earn it like I did. So you know, I just want to say, really, credit to you. You know, it's it's it's. Well, I, say, yeah, I suppose in you. I suppose in some ways it's a little bit of karma. I suppose. Anyways, on the same card as you, Tevin, former world champion, friend. Francisco Vargas will fight Britain's very own Stephen Smith. I remember you going over to Monaco to support Jason Sosa when he fought Stephen Smith. Do you have any kind of opinion yeah. on the Vargas or Smith fight at all? That's, a, that, that's actually that's actually going to be a hell of a fight, man. I I actually can't wait to watch that fight before my fight, man. They they they, they both they both can fight, man. Stephen's a really good guy, and I can't wait to see him fight, man. I mean, if I had to pull for one, I'm definitely going to pull for. Um, Stephen Smith. Yeah, we certainly, certainly hope so. It's, uh, you know, he's, he's had a few chances now, Stephen Smith, and I think this could be one of his last opportunities. So hopefully, he can pull it out of the bag. Right. Um, yeah. Should you should you win this fight, Tevin, that you've got coming up, the supposed next in line to fight you should be Billy Dib. Um, of course, he wants me to add him in. Is, is that all right with you? Can I add him in? Oh well, yeah, you can add him in. Right. Let's let's stay there one second. Let me try to get him in. Hello? Hello, Billy. You, you, Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? 
Yeah. It's Joey. I'm on the line with Tevin. Hey, Joey. How you doing, brother? Yeah, good, good, my man. Good, good. I was just saying to Tevin there that should he win this upcoming fight against Ogawa on December 9th, the supposed next in line will be yourself. Uh, you know, you know yourself, you should be in line. Firstly, what I want to open up with really, Billy, um, I know this because I just spoke to you briefly, but just t- to the listeners and also to Tevin, if he may not know, why were you not given, you know, given the chance to fight for this title? Well, basically, um, uh, what had happened is that I fought on Mikey Garcia's last undercard in uh, New York, and during the fight, I um, received like a little card, and basically, I think I was suspended, but I had no idea that I was suspended, and then um, I got I got a letter saying that you're like, you can't suspend it, so we had to we had to sort that out and get the suspension lifted. But then the IBF said that um, apparently uh, during the time I was offered a uh, world title eliminator against one of the Japanese fighters, um, may may have been Ogawa, but um, apparently um, you know I didn't respond back or I didn't um, get back to them. So they basically kept me at number three, but uh, you know pushed me back in line in terms of getting the opportunity. So now what happens is that um, Farmer and Ogawa were ranked after me, but they still end up fighting each other now for the uh, for the vacant world title, which is, I mean, totally cool because, you know, at the end of the day, I'm still going to get my opportunity. And uh, I guess uh, for me, to face the champion is better than to just win a vacant title. So that's what I look forward to doing in the not-too-distant future, you know? And obviously, you know, you, you were in place, really. Uh, you, you had that fight on Mikey Garcia's undercard. Uh, that was before... Javante had vacated, well, not vacated, but lost the title on the scales. So, you know, you yeah. found yourself in a bit, of, a bit of a stalemate situation, I suppose. I just want to really throw it over to Tevin now. Tevin, this guy on the line here, of course, um, you know, he believes he's going to be sharing the ring with you come, well, come sometime next year. I just really wanted to say, is this a fight that you want, Tevin? Well, is this the fight that presents itself? Hell yeah. And Billy, that's a fight that you want. I'm guessing that you, you know, you'd prefer. Who would you prefer to win, actually, Agawa or Tevin? Who would you like to? Fight oh no, against? I'm gonna be honest. With, I, I'm gonna be honest with you. I really want Farmer to win. You know, I think he's. A, I think he's a, had a, a lovely story. You know, I, I see the story that he has in his life, and I've seen uh, the way he's come up. And you know, he, he didn't have it the easy way. You know, what I mean, this kid really worked hard and persevered. And I believe, you know, um, everyone deserves an opportunity at, um, at glory. And I think that this is his time of success and glory. And you know, I just look forward to sharing the ring with uh, with Farmer. You know, he's a very skilled fighter. I think he's one of the most skillful fighters in boxing today. You know. I mean, he, he's got—he's definitely got some silky smooth skills, and um, you know, there, there would never be an easy fight face with Ron Farmer. You know, but I think it's one of those fights where you know you lift, you lift when you when you face somebody like him. And uh, I just I, I look forward to getting in the ring with him and um, and trying to match his amazing skill set. It's going to be awesome. Now, remember, Tevin has had some issues outside the ring where you know he was shot, but he's still been able to fight. You picked up a cut, which when you look at it on paper, it doesn't really seem as serious as what he's gone through. When will you be ready, or are you ready, pretty much any time oh, in 2018? I'm, 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 I'm ready. I've been ready. I've been ready. My, my cut wasn't even... It was nothing. It was something that was really, really tiny, and uh, nothing that affected me at all, you know. And I, I remember, because um, Farmer got shot on the night that I actually fought on Garcia undercard, so, you know, it was... um. Uh, you know, it was unfortunate that that happened to him, but, you know, everything in life happens for a reason. I know, t- I know Farmer understands that and believes in that. So, you know, you know, everything that's happened has, has set him up for the place that he is now, and, you know, and it just shows his uh, perseverance and dedication. That's what I try to tell kids when I go and visit schools is that, you know, no matter no matter the obstacle that you face in life is you need to continue to persevere and work hard, and that's exactly what Farmer's done. You know, he's continued to persevere and work hard, and I think that that's going to pay off for him, you know. Come come that night when he fights for the world title, you know, I know that he's going to be fighting with all his heart because I know he knows everything that he's been through and what he needs to do to make his life better. And just just quickly now, um, you know, Tevin's not silly. He's not going to look. He's not going to overlook Agawa. He's he's obviously going to go in there hundred percent prepared. Now, providing he comes through that fight, providing Tevin comes through that fight, um, Tevin, I want to ask you this: really, when would you be ready? Providing there's no injuries, when would you be ready? And also, um, in fact, just quickly to Billy, Billy, will you be looking at having a fight in the meantime, 
or will you just wait for the well, shot? Well, well, ba- well basically, I'm just staying. In, I'm trying to stay busy. You know, what I mean, I'm staying busy right now, and um, I'm fighting on December the second in a uh, you know local show in Australia. So I'm just fighting in a ten round um, ten round fight. So you know, just staying busy on December the second, uh, just so that I pick up any ring rust because I know that you know facing a guy like Farmer and having ring rust that could be very detrimental to the performance. So I want to make sure that I'm sharp and that I'm uh, I'm keeping my skills up to date. You know, I'm, I, I really believe Tavon's going to win. This fight, and I really believe that sometime within the next, you know, five or six months, he and I are going to be in the ring together. Yeah, you do need to be sharp because Tevin's a guy. If you threw like, you know, like a like a like a handful of stones at him, I think he'd probably he probably duck all of them. He's very hard to hear, of course. <laughs> at, at, at the best mate, of times. Listen, this, this kid, this kid's very skilled, man. And uh, to be quite honest with you, you know, he he reminds me of a uh, Colonel Whitaker. You know, what I mean, and I think that's, that's a special, um, very very special ability to have. And you know, you got to remember something about Tevin. You know, what I mean, is that kid that hadn't been boxing for that long. You know, what I mean, for him to be doing what he's doing, he was learning on the job you know so when people look at farming the style he's got four losses Oh, well, you know, them four losses mean nothing because he was really learning on the job, you know what I mean? It's not like he had an extensive amateur career or anything like that. And I'm sure if he did, his professional record wouldn't be tarnished by them four losses. And so, you know, I think people have uh, not really given him the credit that he deserves. And, uh, you know, the fact that he's, uh, I mean, he's not a heavy-handed guy, but that just reminds me of Pernell Whitaker because Pernell was not a heavy-handed guy either, you know what I mean? Pernell would, um, you know, use his silky smooth skills to just outbox you and out, out, out with you and out clever you. And in the end, he was always winning. You know what I mean? In that, at one stage of his career, he was pound for pound king. Okay, so Billy, one. I just, I'm just looking for a one-word answer from you now. If you get through your fight December second unscathed, let's say it goes the distance. It's a, you know, it's a kind of hardish fight, but you get the job done. When will you be ready, month-wise? Give me a month. I only need another to to get ready because I because I'm gonna stay ready. You know what I mean? I, I only need, you know, they give me uh, six to eight weeks notice. I'm in. I'm ready. Six to eight weeks. Okay, so we're looking at probably yeah. around about February sort of time. Um, Tevin, yeah, is that I, mean, a good, I love is that, I'd love that February. February, perfect. And Tevin, is that is that a good time frame for yourself? Yeah, I mean, um, I become champion of the world December 9th. I mean, fe- between February and March. You know, at the end of the day, is this how boxing works nowadays? The sanctions and body and TV run most of the uh, run most of boxing. But if it's up to me and, and I get a voluntary defense or whatever the case may be, I mean, I do I, I do think Billy did deserve, deserve a shot because honestly, he, he, he was ranked ahead of me and he was supposed to fight for the belt. So I mean, as a true champion, um, I think it would only be right to um, fight a guy like that. So I, if 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 I, if I got the chance to to do a voluntary defense or whatever the case may be, um, I definitely did, I, I would definitely give him a shot. Uh, he'd be my first option for sure. Well, the the, the thing is, Farmer, the thing is, but you wouldn't have to give me a voluntary because I'd be the mandatory. You know what I mean? I'm going to be the mandatory. So you know, uh, I, I you know I know you're going to win this fight. Well, I believe in you. That, that's you know, I know true. your team believes in you. That's even so, better. You know, I'm, I'm just, I mean, yeah, yeah, for yeah, sure, man. Because, because you know, I, 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 there's, there's, there's things that happen with, with the contracts and things like that. But when you're the manager challenger, you know, there's certain things that happen with the purse split and things like that. So better than a voluntary defense, you know what I mean? For me, it means, you know, earning more money. Facing you as a manager challenger means that I can earn more money. And, and that's exactly what I want to do. Because I, I really don't want to face you as a voluntary because I know that, you know, there's options and things like that. I don't want to give anybody any options. I just want to do the fight and, uh, you know, may the best man win. You know what I mean? That, right. That's the best way to do it. The, you, you see the band story there. That's you know that's even better. It's um yeah for sure. I, like I said before, I definitely think he, I definitely think he deserves a shot. And whether he admits or not, he he definitely get a shot. And if that's the route we have to go, I mean, he, and I will be ready in uh, February or March for sure. God willing, man, I'm going to be ringside watching you do your thing, and I know you're going to bring that title home, and I think you deserve to win it, and it's 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 the greatest feeling in the world, man. There's no feeling like becoming champion of the world, and I think you've worked hard enough, and you've persevered for long enough, and I, I believe that your time has come, man. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Right, and just coming down to the last couple questions now, um, I don't want to do too much on here because if the fight does get made, then I'm guessing we'll probably end up you know, doing this thing again in, in some ways. Firstly, what I do want to say, it's very good to hear from both of you, and, and you know, both of you are such good guys anyway. I know that from my own personal relationships with you both, but to hear you both come on here, there's no trash talking. It's it's very uh, complimentary uh, being on here with, with, you go, with you both, kind of complimenting the other one, so it's, it's quite refreshing to hear that, but I don't want to ruin it all what i do want to say though is billy i want to ask you 
for your prediction if you did take on Tevin, and then I want to throw it to Tevin for his prediction if he fights you. If the fight does happen, I'm going to go over to you first, Billy. If I'm going to fight Farmer, you know, I, I believe that, you know, I'm going to need to, I'm going to, need to score a stoppage win, you know what I mean? Because I, I believe his silky smooth skills are going to be, you know, very hard to basically um, deal with. And I, and I feel that the only way for me to win is to stop Farmer. And Tevin? For me, predictions don't really matter. I can just guarantee the victory. That, that's that's one thing about me. Um, when I come, I come to get the victory. Um, ho- however it happens, however it happens. But that night of the fight, I just want to be victorious. And it's all that matters to me. Whether it's, it's a knockout, split decision, majority decision, you name the decision. As long as my head been raised at the end of the night, that's all I care for. Okay, fair enough, boys, fair enough. Well, listen, Tevin, firstly, it's been a real pleasure speaking with you, as it always is. Uh, Billy, thank you for thank jumping you, really. on at the end there. Best of luck to you both you in both much, of your man. upcoming fights. God willing that you don't pick up a cut or any kind of injury. Touch wood about that. Um, like I say, it's been good talking to you both. If the fight does happen eventually, Appreciate we'll do it, it again. And afterwards, afterwards, when you've both fought, we're all going to go out, the three of us, for a drink in a bar somewhere. <laughs> hey, Farmer, man, I wish you all the best, brother. Fight hard. Fight Thank you, man. man. Do what you do the best, man. I know, I know you got this, man. Take care of yourself, Thanks, man. man. Appreciate it. Good luck. you see a second, man. All right, God bless, okay. man. Take care. God bless. Bye-bye. Okay, and that wraps up episode 110 of the Box Hard Podcast. Sorry once again for the poor audio during that interview and also for some of the echoing during some of, um, you know, some of the speech when Eddie Chambers was talking. So I'm very sorry about that. It's been a hard show this week to make, actually. It's, uh, it's all gone a bit mad, obviously. I, as with his issues um, off the show, you know, personal stuff, it's kind of been a bit crazy. My sleeping pattern's really up the wall at the moment, trying to make it all, so it's been quite a hard one. So please forgive me on that one. Um, you know, sometimes you also don't realise when there's a problem with the recording until after it's recorded. So once again, my apologies for that. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. Eddie Chambers has been Eddie Chambers. A big thank you to our free guests, on this week's show, Miles Shinquin, Tevin Farmer, and of course, former world champion Billy Dibb. I sincerely hope that you've all enjoyed this week's show. I really do. The Prediction League, by the way, the scores at the moment are 13 points for me, 14 points for Ayaz, but you, the listeners, are in the lead with 17 points. Well done to everybody involved. Of course, there's also another two points up for grabs this weekend, so best of luck with that. We'll be back next week with another big show, as always. Until then... Take care.